Welcome to this free Microsoft Excel beginners course. During this four hour tutorial, you will be learning all the essentials of Excel. If you would like to learn everything about this program and use it like a pro, head to skillademia.com and get access to the full course. Now, let's begin. Hi, and welcome to this very first video on Microsoft Excel. Before we go anywhere, let's have a conversation about what is Excel. As you can see on this screen here, this is Excel, and I have a load of data here. Excel can hold pages and pages of data. We have lots of data here taken from a newspaper in 1914. And as you can see, it's just holding lots and lots and lots of information about local individuals. We can also use Excel as a form of calculator, allowed to take certain calculations and values, using values to come up with results that we might want to be interested in. We could use it to record our shopping, identify items that we've bought and sold, and equally allow us to analyze that data using something, these are called pivot tables, these items here. Here's another example of a calculation being undertaken, allowing us to store data. So Excel is really good at storing data and holding data. These sheets can be quite enormous, but the thing about it is it's not just good at storing data. Excel is really good at carrying out calculations on that data. So for example, here we have the stock exchange, the FTSE 100 data coming in, a few fictitious students, expenditure that they spent, and this spreadsheet is looking at their investments and calculating how much they've got left over, how much profit or loss they've made on that. Excel is pulling in that data from the FTSE 100 website, putting that information in and keeping it up to date when we need it. So Excel is a mathematical tool. Excel is a way of collecting data and analyzing data. It's a really powerful analyzing tool but it won't take you long to get used to working with Excel and just being able to do some nice, easy, simple things and progress quite quickly into complex, more advanced functions without even recognizing you're doing so. It's a really interesting, powerful, entertaining piece of software. And once you've got your head around it, you will thoroughly enjoy it. Anyway, in the next lesson, we're gonna look at how do you get hold of Microsoft Excel. So. See you in lesson two. Hi, and welcome to lesson two. How do I get Excel? I've gone to Microsoft.com's website. Now, because I'm in the UK, it's taken me to the English GB site. And if you go to the Microsoft.com, it will select the site based upon your location. But the offerings are basically the same. I have two options at the top here that are of interest, Microsoft 365 and Office. Microsoft Office contains Excel. If we click on Office, it will take me to their web page and that will give us four potential offers that we can go into. Let's have a look at personal and family. If I click on personal and family, it will take me to this page here. Notice it says Microsoft 365 now. That's because if we go back to the page before, Microsoft 365 contains Office. So the program we want, which is Microsoft Excel, is part of Office, and Office is part of Microsoft 365. So let's have a look at what this family and personal version has. Here we've selected for home, and we have two options here. One is to go for the family option, which costs an annual cost in the UK pounds here, 79.99, or you can pay monthly and you can try it for one month free. There is also a personal version which is only available for one person to use at any one time. It's cheaper, again a monthly cost, no free one month trial. What comes with this? Excel, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and other programs within the Microsoft Office suite. What kind of devices would it run on? It will run on a computer, a PC, a laptop, a tablet, or even your mobile phone. And what operating systems will it work on? Well, 
it will work quite happily with Windows, on a Mac or on an Android device. There isn't a Linux version. If we go to business, if you're running your own business, then the offer is also there. The offers are different, you get one month free again, but it's based upon how many users you're likely to have using the package at that time. The other options on that page was enterprise, large businesses and education. Education is if you are a student at a school, college or university, then you might be entitled to get hold of Microsoft Office for free, depending upon your establishment and if it's contributed towards this scheme. Aside from that, those are the offerings. Now obviously, as we say, Microsoft Office costs. There is a monthly cost. And here's one of the problems with this is that it is a rolling cost, so you are paying per year. Now, there are other options available. And the nice thing is Microsoft Excel is not the first version of this piece of software. There are earlier versions and there are existing other options. The skills you're going to learn from Microsoft Excel are transferable. Basically, all spreadsheet programs will use basically the same structure, the same commands. Small things will change, but it won't take you very long to adapt from Microsoft Excel to other such spreadsheet packages. So how do you get hold of these? You simply choose the option you want, download the package and follow the instructions to install it. It's that simple. In the next lesson, we're going to look about opening Excel. See you next lesson. Hi, and welcome to the third lesson. How do I open Microsoft Excel? To start with, the simplest thing to do is to click on the Start button and look for the Microsoft Excel icon, which is this green icon with a small X. The X is obviously for the X in Excel. The icon will be the same no matter if you're on a Mac or an Android device. So to launch Excel on any device, simply look for that icon. When you see it, click and Excel will begin to open up. When you first open up Excel, it will show you a number of options. Along the top is the ability to open a new file. Some of these are tutorials that accompany Excel to help you through some of the more complex tools that are available. Or you could simply open a blank workbook. Beneath there will be a list of any programs, any Excel documents that you opened previously that the system is now aware of. You've got the home button, which is where we are. We can go to open. We now have the same files as we had before. And if I click browse, I'm going to be able to search my system and it will only list XLS documents, Excel documents. I can go to new and under new. Again, I've got the blank workbook, but I've got many more guides and tutorials that will help me through some of the more advanced features of Excel. For ourselves, we're just going to start with a blank workbook. That's where we're going to do our lessons from. So I'm going to simply go over the blank workbook and click. Once clicked, it will open up and you'll be introduced to your first system. You'll be introduced to your first Excel workbook. So in the next lesson, we're going to define some of the features that you can see in this workbook, including what do I mean by workbook? So see you in lesson four. Here we are in lesson four, cells, worksheets and workbooks. We're going to deal with the glaringly obvious parts of Excel and discuss what they are. The first thing that strikes everyone is the rectangles. Unlike any other document, we're greeted with a white page with rectangles all over it. And that's the first thing that people find daunting. These rectangles aren't called rectangles, they're called cells. One cell has a green box around it. That box is telling us that this is the active cell. 
And that means that if I type anything on my keyboard, it's going to appear in that cell. And that's the thing about every single cell. Every cell can hold one thing and one thing only. I can click anywhere and change the active cell. There's no problem with that at all. The cells I can see are not the limitation of the system. You can see that there are numbers running down the side here. Those numbers are called the row references. So the active cell I've got here is in row 16. And if I click here, I'm now on row 26. Notice it goes to 38. But if I start scrolling, I can go further and further. Now I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because there are over a million cells downwards. Now I haven't counted each one, but I have had to travel all the way to the bottom. It takes a long time. The other part of this is along the top. These are not numbers, these are letters. And the letters are the column references. Now I emphasize the letters because if we go to the end, we've got Z and you might think, well, we'd end at 26, but it doesn't. As soon as you get to Z, it goes AA, AB, AC, all the way to AZ, and then becomes BA, BB, BC, and so on. How far does that go? Well, that goes to ZFD. That's 2.5 million cells towards the right. So there are plenty of cells for you to be working with, and you are unlikely to run out of them. Not impossible, just unlikely. So we've got the cell. That's every single rectangle you see on here is called a cell. We've got the active cell. We've got the row reference, and we've got the column reference along the top. This cell has a specific reference, and we always describe it by the column reference followed by the row reference. So this cell has the reference F12. If we move to here, this cell has H14. So every cell has a unique reference. And that's really useful to know. If we look up here, this box is actually telling us that. This is H14, it tells us H14. And anywhere I click, that cell reference is K4. This box is known as the naming box, and we can use that really effectively. And we will look at that shortly when we come to look at selecting cells. So what have I got? I've got cells and I've got the active cell. The collection of cells all together on this entire page is called a work sheet. And you can see this one is called sheet one. You can see a plus here. This is for adding a new sheet. Now I've got another sheet. Again, 2.5 million cells left to right and just over 1 million cells top to bottom. So now I've got two sheets, sheet one and sheet two. Cell references are the same. So just like this one, I'm on H4. If I go to sheet two, I can go to H4, but these are not the same H4. Despite it saying there it is, they are not the same H4. And we can work between sheets. So an Excel document can have one or more sheets. So what do we call it as a collection of sheets? Well, when we come to save Excel, and if we have a look up here, we can see this is Excel. I haven't saved it yet. I'll mention this in a moment, but I haven't saved it yet. And this is called book one. So when I come to save this, it will want to save this as book one. What I'm going to do now is we're going to save this file because I haven't saved this before, save and save as will take me to the same menu. Once I've saved it once, they will take me to different places. But let's prove that. Let's go to the save as first of all. That's what the save as looks like. So let me come back off of this. So back to file, down to save. Your notice is jump to save as, and now I've got my save as area. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to 
a folder which I've got here called Excel lessons but let's help you create that folder let's go to browse I'm in my documents here I've got my Excel lessons there and all I've got to do is go into that folder how did I create it I simply clicked on new folder a new folder appeared and I called it Excel lessons let's go into the Excel lessons folder and there's nothing in there it wants to call it book one that's because a collection of worksheets is called a workbook and you can see that Excel workbook so I don't want to call it book one you need to call these something that describes what you're working on and calling it book one doesn't help because the next one will be called book two and it won't take you very long to have book one to book 100 and someone will say to you where's that spreadsheet and you will go I don't know it's one of these 100 so let's call this lessons I'm going to use this Excel spreadsheet simply to explore some of the ideas in future lessons so I'm going to call it lessons I've put it in my Excel lessons folder and I'm just going to click save now remember I said once I've saved it I then have a different save and save as now because I'm using the internet to save my files Excel has switched on auto save that means that everything I do on here is automatically saved to this file and this file is saved on the cloud if I don't want that if I want to just save it myself I can switch off autosave now when I go to these file I've got the save and save as again if I click on save it just saves it if I go to save as it then offers me the same option and I can rename the file the thing is I've got this running on the web and I'm quite happy to have autosave on but every time we close this down you're going to be prompted if you haven't got autosave on it would ask you to save it every time so that I can show you how that works I'm going to switch autosave off at the moment and leave it as that so what have we got we've got cells the active cell cells are referenced by their column reference and their row reference we have worksheets we can have one or more every workbook must have at least one worksheet but we can have hundreds of worksheets we have worksheets that hold the cells that we're interested in and it offers us even more cells a collection of worksheets are saved as a workbook and that's cells worksheets and workbooks in the next lesson we're going to have a brief look at the ribbon toolbar that's this up here until then see you in lesson five hi and welcome to lesson five in the last lesson you learned about cells you learned about the active cell you learned about worksheets you learned about workbooks and you discovered how to save and save as workbooks and equally the naming convention so giving it a name that makes sense and one that's going to help remind you of what you were looking at the other part of Excel is the menu ribbon bar that's this along here this is the ribbon toolbar and everything you're likely to need is going to be along here somewhere each of the options gives you a range of tools usually associated with the word at the top home is a general collection it holds most things that the others don't hold it also uses the most frequent tools so the ability to change the way the font looks in each cell or in one cell the copy paste tools the undo and redo buttons the ability to center or align your text within or wrap text within a cell that might not make any sense but it will do later merge and center again won't make any sense at the moment but when we combine come to combine one or more cells this tool becomes useful 
this is the format of each cell again you don't need to understand it at the moment but the options there and the ability to control the way cells look we have some controls for that here but these are what we call semi-permanent they will remain the same no matter what data you put into them these are conditional we can also insert delete or format cells rows or columns and then we've got editing tools over here which we will look at later on but that's the mainly the home area insert is obviously for putting things into the worksheet tables well Excel seems to be a table of tables but these tables here are pivot tables and that type and they're very very useful you'll learn about those later on pictures if you want to insert smart art or sh uh, shapes uh, 3d models onto here you do that through here there are other programs that you could add in and include into the system or charts which we'll be looking at later on you've got 3d mapping altering the way uh, charts look or introducing new flash charts and so on and so forth but this is about inserting objects into your spreadsheet how the spreadsheet looks how you want to orientate the way everything is either when you come to print it or how it looks generally for you you can bring things forward and backwards but that's called layering and that's from later on the main thing you'll use within this area is looking here for things like what can I view so grid lines these are these light gray lines that you can see that define each cell you may want to not view them or view them you've got headings those are the cell references top and bottom you might want to switch them off or switch them on again you might want to have them visible when you come to print the document same thing with the headings usually when you print you don't want to see these cell column references or row references and you don't want to see the grid lines but sometimes you do formulas this is the backbone of Excel this is the heart of the power behind it and it looks really confusing so we're not going to spend very long looking here because we're not dealing with these at the moment but when you come to look at formulas later on this becomes really really useful if you remember in the very first video I showed you a spreadsheet that took data from the FTSE 100 and I used this tool the data tool to do so I used the from web option but there are other ones that you can do and you can alter the way that the data is displayed data is simply what is contained in a cell or multiple cells and that can be a column of data a row of data a sheet of data a selection of data or just one cell again don't worry about the terminology there we will go over all and each term as we come across it in the later lessons review this option allows us to do a few things to control the way that our sheet appears or to give ourselves help so it will help us control the spelling or look up keywords it will also allow us to add comments so sometimes you might want to put some data into a cell and then add a comment that tells someone about the data in that cell you can protect a sheet to stop someone from altering the data on that sheet or you can protect the workbook which allows no one to change anything in the workbook unless they remove the protection and you can password protect these and you can equally allow someone only partial access to some of the cells so they might be able to edit this cell but they can't edit that cell there are some good reasons for that and we'll look at those later on view is how you're going to see the spreadsheets so at the moment we're in normal and this is the most common view you have page break view that allows you to see it with lines that show you how it would be divided up if you came to print it on the printer usually for a piece of paper that's a4 size page layout allows you again to see how it would look each cell within an a4 page 
these lines have only appeared now because I've just chosen that option. I can choose a custom view if I want. I also have again the ability to turn off the grid lines, the headings and this option here called the formula bar which we haven't looked at yet but we will do later on. I can zoom into the sheet and I can zoom back to normal and I can even zoom to a selection and I have many other functions the freeze panes become useful later on so I have many options available to me and we can explore those later on this line by the way will appear if you've selected page layout or page break preview now assuming you're following along with me this will appear we need to get rid of it because it's just rather annoying and you'll notice that it appears all the way down so rather than that confuse us we're going to have to just do a couple of steps and if you followed me let's help you get rid of them but the steps I'm going to show you are not an essential part of the lesson I'm not going to test you on what I'm going to show you now to get rid of them we simply need to go to file we need to go down to the bottom and look for the word options we click on options and this menu will appear within they then need to go to advanced scroll down in this center part I'm using the middle mouse button just to scroll down slowly if I don't want to do that I can use a scroll bar this is a scroll bar on this side here that allows me to go up and down and if I keep scrolling I'll get to a section that says display don't know we're not interested in that one so if I scroll down a bit further I've got display options for this workbook not interested in that one I've then got one that says display options for this worksheet and I've got show page breaks as soon as I clicked on these Excel ticked this for me but Excel has not been giving hasn't given us a nice option to switch this off as easily as it switched it on so I'm simply going to click take that out click on OK and as if by magic those lines have disappeared you don't have to remember that that's not part of the lesson here but just in case you followed me through down that little rabbit hole we're back to where we should have been so that's the that's the ribbon toolbar this will become more and more familiar with you as you go through more and more of the lessons but in the next lesson we're going to have a look at these cells again and something I did a few moments ago that probably made you go what is he doing is we're going to be looking at selecting cells and a little bit more about this name box so see you in the next lesson hi and welcome to lesson six so do you remember we looked at the spreadsheet initially and we talked about these things called cells and I talked about the active cell and then in the last video I started clicking around and seemed to do some really weird things so let me go through some of these things I have here as I say the cells and I have the active cell but I can simply by clicking holding the mouse button down and dragging the mouse down I have the ability to select more than one cell now you'll notice that they are greyed out that these are selected and you can tell that because of the green box so are these now all active cells well no the active cell is the one at the top and we can see that by the F5 up here that's the active cell but I have selected these cells and that allows me to do a few things with these I can change the way they look which is what we're going to be looking in the next video so selecting cells can be really useful I can select cells and then I, what I can do is I can press the enter key on my keyboard and the active cell will change and if we look in the name box I can now see that F6 F6 is the active cell now F7 and so on and when I get down to the bottom it goes back to the top so I can change the active cell which means that as soon as I'm there I can actually type and press enter and the details will appear there now don't be tempted to use the arrow keys because that will deselect the cells you've got 
that's all right. I've pressed the delete key to get rid of the content. So look for the delete key, which is normally to the right of your enter key, and you just delete the content. So I can select a range of cells. Notice I emphasize the word a range. That's not me just being weird. That's the term for it. So I've selected a range of cells. So this is called a range. I don't know, I don't have to just go downwards. Obviously, I can go upwards as well. And I can go to the right or I could go to the left. Equally, I could also go diagonally and I can go a selection of cells in that sense. So I can select more. Remember, it's click, hold the mouse button down, drag down and then across and keep moving the mouse and until you let go of the mouse you can choose how wide you want that to be. When I press the enter key I will go through changing the active cell but it will only be active within the selected range. Remember don't use the arrow keys or you'll lose what you've selected. It's not gone it's just that I've now got to go and reselect them if I want to. What else can I do? Well I can also select by column by simply clicking on the columns cell reference. If I click there, I've now selected everything in column G. And I mean everything. I told you originally there are one million, over one million cells going down. I have now selected all a million plus cells. And if I wanted to do the I, I can do so. And if I want to click, hold the mouse button down and drag it across, I can select multiple columns. Obviously I can do the same with the cell references for the rows. Slip, click on them and I've emphasized I've click on them and I will select the entire row. Everything in that row. That's that 2.5 million cells are now all selected ready for me to do something with them. Again, I can select a range of rows. Now, I could select all rows, but that means going down all the way down by a million. That's a bit tiring. To do the other way, I could do it that way, but there's 2.5 million that way, so that's not very good. So what I could do is instead of clicking on the columns to select the columns or the rows to select the rows, I could also go between them to what doesn't look like it's a button at all. But click on that and I've now selected the entire sheet. All 2.5 by 1 million of them. That's a huge number of cells. So I've now selected them all. Something worth noting about selection. Let's look back at this name box. It keeps telling me what is the active cell. F5, C3. I9 but let's now click hold the mouse button down and drag down can you see as I drag down I've selected four cells and it's saying 4R X1C the X is just represents times the R is row the C is column I have four rows by one column selected and if I keep moving that I can see now I've got six rows and four columns. Remember, I haven't let go of the mouse button, so that's perfectly fine. As long as I keep doing that, I can keep moving that and those numbers will change. It's not until I've stopped eight rows by five columns and let go of the mouse will it return to telling me which one's the active cell. So that's really useful. I now know how many cells I've selected. Why is that useful? Well, when we come to the revision lesson, we'll see how that becomes useful to us. So I can select a range of cells. Another way of doing quick cells is to click on the cell and then rather than hold the mouse button down and run it across, is to click on a column hold down the shift button now that's usually ab above the what's called control button the CTRL it's got an, a, an empty arrow pointing upwards and usually has the word shift you've actually got two of them 
one on the left hand side of your keyboard and one on the right hand side the right hand side just the right hand side one being just below the enter key but if I hold down the shift key I then can move my mouse all the way over to let's say the R click and it will select all that range just in a simple click B shift R selected to shift 29 selected and then we've got that weird one well do you remember I said that the shift key is just above the control key the CTRL key well let's hold down the CTRL key if I hold that one down if I click on B first then hold down the CTRL key and then click on D I've selected columns B and D but not C this differs from the shift because shift will click select everything from B to D this will only select the columns I'm clicking on not only that but I can click on rows as well at the very least this lets me build a very pretty pattern out of the crossovers all the time until I click away so the shift key will allow me to select multiple cells from B to let's say Z if I've chosen an active cell and then hold down shift and click on B it will select everything across there I can hold shift and do entire rows or I can hold down the CTRL key and select just the cells I'm interested in and obviously if I click on the cell hold down shift and then click down here it will do the same thing then so holding down shift click first of all on the cell you want hold down the shift key click somewhere else and now I've got my selection 17 R 17 rows by 9 columns is this selection I'm still holding the shift key down as soon as I let go of it it tells me the active cell is E5 similarly I could click there I've clicked on D5 I'm now going to hold down the control key and I'm going to click on G9 and you can see that I can select just the cells I'm clicking on and it's just very pretty that does become useful so knowing what the shift key does and what the control key does is really useful do notice by the way when I'm doing the control key one the active cell is the last one I clicked on so the active cell changes with that option what happens when I press enter it jumps in order between the selection hopefully you remember the order so in this video we've learned how to select cells just by clicking just by dragging just by dragging to the side just by dragging downwards clicking on the columns clicking on the rows clicking on the columns and dragging clicking on the rows and dragging remember when I say dragging I mean hold down the mouse the left hand mouse button and drag downwards using the shift key to do a range of cells between the two points clicked can be that column row or just a selection of cells or hold down the control key and simply select only the rows and columns you choose or just the cells you choose that selection in the next one we're going to be looking at altering the columns and rows that might sound a little bit mysterious it will make complete sense at the end of the next video so see you there hi and welcome to lesson seven altering rows and columns so what do I mean by altering rows and columns well let's have a look at the situation I've selected cell D10 and I'm just going to press a few keys on my keyboard notice that the cell contents can go beyond the cell so when I press enter the contents of cell D10 now extend into E10 and if I then put some data into cell E10 it 
cuts short or concatenates cell D. It trims it off. The data is still there. Here's the formula bar, by the way. The formula bar is showing us what data is in that cell. So I can see, if I look at the cell here, I can see it's got F, 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 G at the end. But if I actually click on the cell, I can see that it's F, 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 G, F, H, G, and so on. So there's a lot more I can see there. So if I click on an active, if I make a cell active, sorry, then I can see the contents of that within the formula bar, which you might say to yourself, well, okay, that's quite useful if it extends too far, but I can see the contents. That becomes much more clear later on. So we're looking here. We've got the contents there, and they overlap. So what could I do about that? Well, I could click on there, as we learned in the last lesson, to make that the active column. I don't actually have to do that. But it marks out what I'm trying to do. And then between the cell column D and column E, there is a line. And if I move my mouse just over top of it, I can see that the arrow that's pointing downwards, which says select column E or select column D, I can move it between and it suddenly changes to an arrow pointing both directions. Click, hold the mouse button down drag towards the side and you'll notice there's a new box appeared width 11.43 and in brackets 85 pixels and simply keep extending it let go and you can start to see more and more of the contents take a little bit further and I can see the whole of the contents now I'm going to take that back so I'm roughly where I was before I don't have to have selected that column to do so. I can do that anyway. So it doesn't have to be the active column that is selected. I can alter the column even if it's not the active one. Trying to judge roughly where it is can be a bit annoying. Let's take that back again. There's another trick. This time, go between the two cells again, exactly as we've been doing. Just go between them and then double click. That means click with the left hand mouse button rapidly twice. One, two. And it's auto fitted the column to the data. If I do it to E, go between them and double click, it's moved marginally. If I put the word cat. I held down the caps lock by accident there, but that's all right. We can work with that. And if I now go before F, it will reduce the size of it. Notice, by the way, that if I want to make this cell wider, if I want to make column D wider because the contents are tight there, I have to go to the line after it. Going before makes no sense. Going after makes it wider to it. So I can alter the columns either by selecting the boundary and widening or by double clicking to fit the data. What if I selected a selection? What if I now altered a selection of columns? What if I decided to alter just column H while I've got D to J selected. Let's just see. I'm going to move that. Now I'm going to be looking at that box that's appeared. I'm holding the left hand mouse button down and I'm looking at that box and notice I'm, I've got two numbers. At the moment 9.86 and then 74 pixels. Pixels are the smallest definable point on the screen. It's a dot. Now what a dot is, it's the smallest dot your screen can talk to. It's the smallest dot your computer can alter in any way, shape or form. Your screen is defined by pixels. How many pixels along by how many down. The other number is how many characters can fit in. If you remember with the D one, it cut it off slightly. So 9.86 is wide enough to have almost 10 characters appear. That 9.86 is pretty useless at most times but pixels is really useful. So let's focus on that. Let's take this to 100 pixels. There it is. Now I'm going to let go. It's not just altered the H column 
to 100 pixels it's altered the selection to 100 pixels so if I choose a selection and I alter the width then yes I do have to make sure it's one of the ones that is selected doesn't matter which one it will apply whatever I do let's make them smaller let's take it down to 50 and it's altered them all to 50 so I can alter a selection of columns and obviously if I can do that to columns I must be able to do that to rows again this time it's the midpoint between two rows and if I've done a selection I need to make sure it's within that selection but let's take that to 48 and let go and there it is if I want to double click by the way it will pull them back to auto fit the cells to fit the data that's in there and since I've only got this data it auto fits the default size I don't have to select and I can choose any column sorry any row and I can alter it as I want and double click so I can do that so selecting a column will allow me to alter its width I can alter the width without selecting but if I select a range it allows me to alter that range to the same width keeping them uniform and the same is true for rows and again it doesn't matter as long as it's a selected range as long as I go between two of the selected rows or even at the end it's perfectly happy no point in going before that doesn't tell Excel anything if I do that it will alter row one so what about altering the entire sheet well again when we talked about selecting the cells we know we could click on a hold down shift and then go all the way to Z FD or whatever it is but that's a long way away that's 2.5 million cells away so what we're going to do instead is instead of doing that do you remember the button there if I click on the button there I now have selected the entire sheet now I can select the column width let's put this to 80 and the entire sheet has a column width of 80 every single column in this entire sheet is now set to 80 pixels wide and if I alter the rows and let's move this to 40 every single row on this sheet is now set to 40 pixels so I can control the entire sheet by using this button that doesn't look like a button have I altered the other sheet? No. All I'm altering is this one sheet. So I can alter this quite happily simply by clicking there and altering this. Let's now take that to 60. Or doing the same there. I can not click anywhere and just alter a single column or a single row or a selection of columns and a selection of rows if I double click then it auto fits to the data and if I take there and double click it will alter auto fit to the data in each column hopefully that's been useful hopefully that makes sense and you can see now that it's quite nice when you've got a lot of different data of differing widths simply selecting the columns of interest and double clicking will make the data fit to suit the data that's contained in the cells okay so in the next lesson we're going to be looking at borders again that might not make any sense at the moment but in the next video it will make complete sense See you there. And here we are at lesson eight, borders. And this is where we left lesson seven. 
I'm going to get rid of the data here by simply selecting the three cells of data and pressing the delete key. That's got rid of all the data. Now, we have already learnt about these grid lines and we understand that if we go to view, we can switch the grid lines off or back on again. We do understand that when we print, the grid lines won't appear. We know that because on the page layout, we understood the grid lines don't have a tick under print. So when we come to print this, the grid lines aren't there. But when we view the spreadsheet, they do appear. And again, we could switch that off if we wanted to. It's the same button. So what if I did want the grid lines to appear? Well, I could do the print, but that's then going to do it across every single cell. Maybe I only want certain cells to appear with a grid line. Well, we don't call it a grid line. We call it a border. So let's just go to cell D3 and let's go to the home option. As I go through, I've got the undo, the clipboard and the font. Now it's quite unusual, but under the font option in the middle is this icon here. And you can see that when I move my mouse over top, then the little help box appears and it offers me bottom border. And if I click on that, and move the active cell away, I've got a bottom border there. If I now go to page layout and turn the grid lines off, that remains. It doesn't appear anywhere else, just there. I'm going to put the grid lines back, go back to home. What other options do I have? Well, next to that option is a little drop down menu. So if I click on that, I get another, of, another options. I've got bottom, then I've got top. Well, let's click on top. Does that remove the bottom? No. So I can add to the list of items I've got. On the drop down, I've got left and I've got right. So I've got now a box. Now, if I want to get rid of that box, I could select no border and as if by magic, it's disappeared. It took me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight clicks to make that box. And then just one click to get rid of it. That seems a serious waste of time. And the nice thing is I have the option to just simply say all borders and that puts a box around it. I also have another option. Let's just get rid of that, no borders. If I click there, I also have one that says outside borders. So how does outside borders differ from all borders? Well, now let's see, let's just get rid of that one. Now let's choose a selection of cells. Now let's do all borders. And you can see it's now done a border around all the cells I selected. And if I select that, range of cells again and then choose no borders they've all disappeared if i do that again and i now say outside borders that's all it's done giving me the outside if i tell it to do thick outside borders then clearly it's done thick outside borders and i have a number of other options i could use a double line at the bottom and so on the thing is, is that that's really neat, but there are a load and load of options that I might want. I might not want the double border at the bottom, but I might want it on the right or the left or at the top. And I might want it in the middle and I might want thick outside along the top. I might want a multitude of options and I've only got a finite number of options here. So what if I wanted to change lots of things? What if I wanted to have more control? Well, if we go all the way to the bottom, we've got one that says more borders. And if I click on more borders, then what I have here, can you see this? This is what I've already got for that selection. I put a double underline, it's showing it to me there. And I can simply click on this image to remove the lines. If you notice, the double line became a solid line. That's because that was the other line that existed. It took me two clicks. 
But what I can do very simply is choose the line and then simply click where I want them to go. That would do the outside border. Now that might seem more of a waste of a click, but actually what if I click in the middle? Though I only had to click once, it's done all of those vertical lines for me because I told it to do all inside lines. And I can obviously do the same for the rows, so the horizontal lines. And I can change them. I can decide which ones I want by selecting each one. I could take the top line away and tell it to be double, or I could choose that one. And since that's the one selected, wherever I now click, it will change to that double line. But if I didn't want it, I just click again and keep clicking, get rid of it or change it to what I do want it to be. And if I want that one, all the inside ones to be a dot dash, I can do that. I can even change the color of the lines. Let's choose a bright red. Now that's a bright red dashed. That's a thick red border. And the more I do that, the more I can alter. I can even change the color and do a diagonal. What use that is? It looks very creative, but that's fine. I've got that. Now I'm going to select all these and I'm going to press the delete key on my keyboard. Oh, nothing's happened. Well, these are borders. This is not data. So Excel's not allowing me to delete it because the delete key deletes data, not borders. And clearly the easiest way of getting rid of the border is to go no borders and it's gone. And again, there's nothing wrong with selecting the whole sheet and telling it all borders. But why would you do that? Now, in the next video, we're going to be doing a revision exercise. We've learned lots over the last sets of videos. So we want to do a revision exercise where we go over that and practice it. So before we do that anymore, I've got my lessons XLS and hopefully if you've been stopping the videos and going away, you've got used to saving your work, but you may have kept along or kept it open in the terror that actually you don't know how to save, you can't remember. So that's fine. Remember, you can go to file and because we've saved this file already, we can go to save and that will simply save it. I could click on this disk symbol, that too would save it. The other choice is to click on the X there and people are always terrified of clicking the X because it's big and it's red and it's saying X don't do that and early versions of Windows that was a very bad way of closing things down. But if I click on this and because I've made a change to this sheet if I click on that it will warn me that I haven't saved it and it's giving me the option do I want to save this worksheet, workbook, or do I want to not save it, or do I want to cancel and just go back, take a breath, recover from the panic, and either click on the disk symbol there to save it, or go to save there, or give it a new name and save it. This is called lessons.xls, and I'm just going to click save. It's told me it's saved, that's fine all ready to be closed. Now I can click on the X and it now closes Excel as well. All ready for the revision lesson in the next video. Okay, so we're into lesson number nine and this is a revision exercise. So this is where you do need to follow alongside just to practice everything we've been looking at and to understand how to do the task we've understood. So let's start off with a really simple one. Let's click on the start button and find Excel. Start up Excel. We're going to work with a blank workbook. So I'm going to click on blank and I'm now taken to the blank workbook. And just before we slow down a little bit, I'm going to go to file. Doesn't matter, remember, it doesn't matter if I go to save or save as. I'm going to just click on save, it will take me to save as. And I'm still in Excel lessons, so I'm going to click on Excel lessons. And I'm going to call this one Times Table Square. 
it doesn't matter if you have capitals or not it doesn't matter if you spell times table square wrong it doesn't matter at all it doesn't matter if you put spaces in or don't put spaces in it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you call your worksheet rhinoceros it just won't make any sense but calling it times table square don't panic if you haven't spelt square correctly or anything else it doesn't matter just that the name has some relevance and I'm going to click on save now remember my version of Excel is connected to the cloud to the internet so my version automatically puts on auto save and just so that I can keep make sure that you are able to follow through and that you're not left with a spreadsheet that you can't close because I haven't shown you how to I'm going to switch off auto save there it is times table square saved here we are on this worksheet our workbook has one worksheet and the millions of cells so what we're going to do first is we're going to alter the width of our columns and I want to do that for the whole sheet so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to this little square there remember that one and I'm going to click with the left I'm going to click with the left mouse button to select the entire sheet then what I'm going to do is any of these lines between it doesn't matter which but any of them I'm going to click and I'm going to alter them so that the pixels says 50 pixels just like that I don't care about the 6.43 I'm looking at the 50 pixels and that's fine I'm going to let go of the left hand mouse button and everything's fine I'm then going to go down here and I'm going to do th the same thing with the rows but obviously I'm going to alter their height and I'm going to again take that to 50 so because pixels define the screen size 50 pixels high by 50 pixels wide I'm now going to left let go of the left hand mouse button I'm going to end up with squares everywhere now that's really neat that's what I want now what I also want to do is I'm going to want a group of cells 11 cells by 11 cells so what I'm going to do is click there and remember I'm going to look at this name box so click there hold the mouse button down drag down and across until that says 11 R by 11 C 11 rows by 11 columns and I'm going to let go so I've now selected those cells now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the border tool but I'm not going to click on the border button I'm going to click on the drop down to its right click and the menu drops down I'm going to go all the way down and I've got more borders I'm going to click on more borders I'm going to make sure that the style I've got is this one here just the thin line and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to do the outline that's all the outside and the inside now obviously I could have just done insert all borders but I want you to get used to using this tool click on OK I'm now going to click away and I've got a 11 by 11 grid of squares which have got borders on and if I now go to page layout and I take the grid lines view out I can see that that stands out when there's no other grid lines there so that's everything we looked at so far we've widened the columns we've increased the height of the rows and we've altered the background sorry the borders of the cells so that we've got a nice grid there I've also hidden the grid lines which I'm going to bring back for the moment because we want to reference those now a new trick we haven't done before is down here this is sheet one not very informative so all I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on that word sheet one double click that means click with the left hand mouse button quite rapidly one two 
notice it's gone gray now what a lot of people will do is then press delete or anything else but because it's all gray because it's all selected I just need to start typing I don't need to press delete or backspace or anything else all I need to do is times table square press enter and that's now the name of my worksheet yes it's the same name as my workbook but that's fine I'm only going to have one sheet on here so that's a trick we haven't learnt there's a new one name the sheets which we'll do a lot more of later on so I've now got a grid 11 by 11 but I don't want this one so easy enough go to home click on the drop arrow and choose no border but now I've got a really horrible missing section there and if I hide the grid view it just looks odd so several ways I can solve that one is to obviously go in there and tell it outside border there or the other way is to again get used to using the more borders and just tell it I want a border there and now we've got this nice cutout showing us our grid and we're going to make much more use of this in the next revision exercise see it wasn't that bad but before we go we've got one more thing to do we're going to go file save I'm going to check up here times table square you might have seen it flash up with saving times table square saved I can now go to the X or I could go to close close is going to close the spreadsheet but I might want to click on the X to close Excel that's it for the revision exercise in the next one we're going to start looking at adding data to our spreadsheet so see you in the next video hi and welcome to lesson 10 where we're going to be exploring types of data to start off I'm going to open up Microsoft Excel once open I'm going to then open the lessons spreadsheet that I was working on before now we've got two worksheets I'm clicking on the tabs at the bottom that's what these are called tabs and the first sheet has become a little bit messy I've mi mixed the sizes of the cells up so what I'm going to do is give myself something clean to work with I'm going to right click on the sheet tab and select delete it's going to warn me I can't undo this and I'm simply going to confirm the deletion I've only got sheet 2 now and what I'm going to do as we've done before I'm now going to double click that click twice with the left hand mouse button and then I'm just going to rename this let's call this one types of data okay so what do I mean by types of data well we've already seen that I can type things in and they're going to be accepted into the cell each cell can hold one piece of data and only one piece of data but I can keep typing things in and we know that we've got over a million cells down by over 2.5 million cells left to right so we've got a lot to play with what if I put in a number well suddenly I've got a change the number has moved to the right of the cell while the words or on the left of the cell what Excel is recognizing here is that these first two are text these are words while this third one is a number and it's recognizing it as a number and that's really useful I can do decimal numbers I can put in dates I can put in times so there's a range of things that Excel will recognize and they will recognize it differently to simply text that we started off with before so 
what kind of types do I have available? Well, if we look here, I've got a range of options that I can select here. In fact, this one that says number is a little bit disingenuous because it's really not about just number. It's about all the data types. And if I click here, I can see a number of the most popular formats that the system uses. We've got general. It's not really defined. But over here is text. So if I go to these, this cell here, I can see that it's marked general. I could tell it to be text. Nothing's changed. It was text before. I could go to here. It's still seeing it as general, but it's treating it as a number format. I could define it as number. The thing about that is Excel's now decided that because it's a number, and now I've confirmed it as a number, it's given me two decimal places, and I might not want those. So that's a little bit frustrating. I can get around that. If I look at this number area under the Home tab, I've got these options here. This one removes the decimal places. This one increases the decimal places. So if I wanted to return just a two, I simply remove all those trailing zeros. Okay, so that's really useful. What else can I do with these buttons here? Well, let's say I put 2.3. That's very nice, but maybe it's not 2.3. Maybe it's some money. So I can simply click on this button and it will change it to your locality's currency. But what if I don't want it in that currency? Well, if I click on the little drop down next to it, I can change the currency. So there's US, there's the Euro, and I can go to more accounting formats and it will give me a range of symbols that I'm able to use. So let's just look at that again. I can enter a number. So it looks like 4.5 is messy for currency. Click on there, click on the currency, and it will choose it, change it into currency. If I want to change the currency type, I can use the most popular ones in my region. Or if I want to be more elaborate, then I can click on more accounting formats and then I can decide which format I would want to use. And there's, as you can see with the scroll bar here, there is a lot of them. So that's really useful. I've got currency. You'll also notice that it changed it from 4.5 to 4.50. So it's recognized it, that it should have the right the decimal places for that format. I can use decimals but I might decide that actually that's not just a decimal it's a percentage so I could use the percentage sign I can even type in a number and using the keyboard press the percentage sign and the computer will recognize it as a percentage sign so I can create percentages using the keyboard or change numbers into percentages by clicking on this symbol here. What if I type in a large number? Well, I have this option here. I might be in a situation where I want this to have commas to separate out the characters. So I'm going to click on that and it's going to add characters. Notice it's put trading zeros we can get rid of those or put those back notice it's seeing can you see it's saying accounting there it's assuming that this column is all part of this accounting range if I click somewhere else for general then it will act differently I've got short date and long date so I can take a date like the 13th of the 1st 2022 that I used earlier select it it's chosen it if we just check it says date I can change it to long date 
or I can change it back the short date it's up to me and obviously we have time there other ones we've got well let's look at our giant number here I could change that to scientific remember I said earlier I could put in decimals but I could change those to fraction and that will work so there's a number of formats I've got available to me that I can work with here the difference by the way between currency and accounting is down to the way the numbers are represented so let's put in some nice numbers let's select those numbers and then I'm going to choose currency so I now have everything spaced out and that's quite nice I'm going to extend the size of this cell I'm going to take it to a hundred and you can see that that's all stuck to the left hand side now what I'm going to do is keep the same numbers select them again and this time choose accounting now if I widen the cell you'll notice that for accounting purposes the symbol is being kept to the one side and the value to the other side there are also changes for negative values let's use this and I'm going to make this negative now I could just start typing the number again but actually one of the things I could do much more effectively is start using this formula bar I'm going to go out to the formula bar I'm going to click just before the first one I'm going to put a minus symbol in there and press enter now let's put the minus symbol on this side of the pound sign I'm going to go to here and do the same thing here put the minus sign in and press enter and it's done the same thing here so it's changing the format allowing me to see how the currency is presented so the currency is much clearer here let's have a look at one other thing I'm going to take this number I'm going to put the commas. Can you see how the cell is expanding? You might have caught, you might have caught a glimpse of something when I was using the date symbol. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force Excel to not display the whole number. If you see this, this series of hash marks, it's not a problem. The computer is telling you, Excel is telling you that it can't display all of the data that more data exists it's just saying you need to widen the cell and now you can see it so we've got a range of data types available to us this is just the main selection if I go to more number formats I've got much more control I can even create my own but we'll look at that at a later date so that's types of data this tool here is incredibly useful so we're going to use that more as we go through the lessons anyway in the next lesson we're going to look at formatting the data so see you in lesson 11そう、remember that we go to the plus and I simply click on the plus and a new tab will appear. We don't want to use sheet one, so I'm going to double click and I'm going to change that to formatting data simply to tell us what's going on. And then what I'm going to do is simply put some data in here. Let's do the ones I used from before. The two words cat and dog. Now, what I can do here is do things that we've probably experienced in other programs. For example, 
I can choose the word cat and I can change the font face I can change the font size I can make things bold italicized underline alter the underline to double underlined I can change the font color or choose a new color I can use these buttons to make the font larger or smaller in steps it's worth noting with underline that underline really shouldn't be something you use because it makes the text harder to read underline comes from the time of typewriters when underlining was the only thing we could do if any of you remember the typewriter it used to be that you used to have to push the carriage back slightly hold down the shift key press the underline and hammer hard to create the only form of emphasis we had you might have wanted to roll it back and just type over the words but you ended up with blurred not bold text so underlining is something you should resist similarly with italics it looks very nice but for certain people particularly people with quite profound dyslexia will find italicization much harder to read so unless it's really important it's worth not having it if the spreadsheet's for your own use and you don't have any interference with it then use it but otherwise I wouldn't bother so we can change the format of the font simply by clicking on the text now there's not a lot more I can do with that one of the other things we might want to pay attention to is in the previous lesson we looked at the number option and now we're looking at the font option and we're going to look in a moment at the alignment option so if I look at these I can see there's one thing they've all three of these have got in common and several of the others do there's this little symbol in the bottom right hand corner when I move my mouse over top I get a bit of a help box pop up tells me what I could do that thing in the brackets is telling me shortcuts the control key on the keyboard holding the shift key on the keyboard and pressing F but at the moment I'm just going to click on it when I do so I get this box come up now you can see I can change the font here I can make it regular italic bold bold italic I can change the font size I can change the underline and use actually slightly different options I can change the colors I can even choose strike through that will put a line through I can make it superscript so it goes up super means to go up like Superman or I could choose subscript which moves it down sub meaning below so I can actually alternate between the two so I can have text up high or text down low and that will work quite effectively but I'm going to leave that for the moment so I can use that you'll notice I have more tabs here and these actually relate to some of the other things we've got the border tool on the font menu and there's the border tool that we saw before we've got the bot the bucket here and that relates to this menu here um, we've got the number and we've seen that before here and we've got the alignment which is something we're going to look at in a moment I'm just going to click cancel okay so let's just have a look at something else we can do so I'm going to put X2 now that might look a little bit odd but hopefully you'll remember X squared from your time at school or you might have used it recently or any other time but that's clearly not what I've got here now I'm going to use the formula bar just to get up to the text here another way of representing this is to use the carat symbol that is holding the shift key down and then tapping the six the key with number six on it and you'll get the carat symbol and that's a symbol used in computing frequently to mean to the power of so that means x squared but it certainly doesn't mean x squared as we learnt it it's just a little bit confusing 
Now I've been using the formula bar, but I could simply just double click in the cell and I can edit it there. So I'm going to get rid of the Karat symbol and instead I'm going to hold down the shift key while I've got that flashing line. That flashing line is called the cursor and while that cursor is flashing I'm going to hold down the shift key. I'm going to press my arrow key that's on my keyboard towards the right and I've selected that too. Now look at this menu bar. Look at the toolbar so many of the options are greyed out that means we can't access them but notice with the font one not only can I access it but I have this item here I'm gonna click and we've got the menu we saw just a minute ago notice all the other options have gone I've just got the font but this allows me to then choose the superscript for example and click OK and then click away and now I've got the X squared we're used to seeing. Similarly I could do a similar thing with Y2 but maybe I want this to be marked as a second character so instead of doing superscript I do subscript and click on OK and now I get that as well. So I can use the font tool on individual characters within the cell as well as for the whole cell itself. Notice how my characters at the moment are on the left hand side of the cell. I can change that. I can tell it to appear on the right hand side by using this alignment tool which is right align. I can click on the middle one and that's called center and that will put them in the dead center of the cell. I can do something else. We clearly have got these here, but I might need to build a bit of space for you to see. So I'm going to select these two rows. I'm going to pull the cells down 50 pixels each. And now you can see that the text is at the bottom of each of the cells. So I'm going to select them and I'm going to tell it to be centered. So that is vertical centering. And obviously I can also tell it to be at the top. I can do that individually, obviously, but sometimes it's nice to do it on both. There are other things I can do. For example, we're used to the idea now that when I put some text in, the text runs past the cell. And we're used to the idea that I can double click there and now it extends to the cell. But I can also use the symbol here to control the direction of the text. At the moment it's running horizontally, but I could decide that I want to run it vertically. And again, double click and it will fit the text in. I might decide that that's really difficult to read, so I'm going to rotate the text or rotate the text the other way. So I can do a number of things with this text. I can just start rotating it. I can go clockwise or counterclockwise. and obviously I can choose the format symbol and let me just go to back to that at the bottom format cell alignment and we should be used to the idea that this bottom option invariably opens up a menu and this is the menu we glanced at momentarily before and here I can tell it to center horizontally or put it at the bottom of the cell the center of the cell I can even change the direction of the text to anything I would like it to be. I can alter it all I like. Now if I've done something and I don't want to have that, maybe I don't like that and now I'm stuck, I'm going to introduce you to your best friend ever. And that's this button here. This button here is the undo button. Rather than go back and alter everything, I can simply click on that 
and it will restore me back to the last state. If I've done lots of errors, I can keep clicking on that and it will walk me through each of my errors until I get back to where I started. And if I've done many errors, it's recorded everything I've done since I opened the spreadsheet. So there's lots of things. Sometimes I might have undone something and then wished I hadn't. So there is a redo button that will put everything back to where we were. So what else have we got here? Well, we can increase indentations. So let's take this cell, let's widen this out nicely. Let's put these to the left hand side. Remember, I want these to be auto filled. I'm gonna choose the whole sheet. I'm gonna go down here. I'm simply gonna double click. And so everything alters to its contents. What I'm going to do here is tell that to indent. Indent just pushes in by roughly four spaces and I can keep indenting or I can remove the indent, decrease the indent. So I can do that with any text. If I've got a wide enough area, I can create indentations. Okay, only two more buttons on the alignment time to look at. So let's have a brief look at these. So this is some text. And what I'm gonna do is click on that and I've clicked on this wrap text button. Just to show that again, I've clicked on the wrap text button. Nothing has happened. But let me now shrink the cell down. All I've got is the word sum. Again, nothing seems to have happened. But now if I double click on there, the text is wrapped down through the box. Just to show the effect without wrap text, that's it without, that's it with and it's automatically recognizing that it now needs to widen the cell for me. So I can simply change the wrap and wrap text within the cell. The last option here is this merge and center. Now there's a number of options here you might want to look at, but at the moment, let's just look at the one that we've got by default. Now I've got a sentence here and it runs over more than one cell and I could simply widen the cell. But there are times when I've got data around here that I can't just widen the cell because that will make other data out of line. So sometimes it's useful for me to be able to select the cells. Remember that click, hold the mouse button down and drag, then let go. I can tell it to merge and center. And that one cell, those three cells have now become one single cell. Now the center part simply means that when I widen these, the text will remain in the center. I can change that by using these buttons here. But merge and center allows me to merge one cell, sorry, more than one cell into a single cell. If I click on merge and center again, it returns me back to where I was with this piece of text in that one cell there. So in this lesson, we've looked at how to format text and how to do alignment for that text. And that's quite a lot. So I'll leave you with that. And in the next lesson, we're gonna be looking at something called autofill, creating a series. Okay, welcome to this lesson on creating a series, something called autofill. And in this one, I've created already a new worksheet. I've got the tab here. So I obviously I clicked on the plus. It said sheet whatever number. I double clicked and I changed it to creating a series. And what I've then gone and done is added some data into these cells, as you can see here. And we're gonna work with these at the moment. What we're going to do is I'm going to click onto the cell here and I'm going to notice that when I click on the cell, not only is it the active cell, but down at the bottom right hand corner is a small green, in this case green, square. 
and if I move my mouse over top of it and I'm very gentle about it it changes to this small black plus sign and that's really important usually the XL one is this large white shadowed plus cell and if I go to the cell it changes on the edges to this arrow which we'll look at much later on but this bottom right hand corner is very special what I'm going to do is I'm going to click hold my left mouse mouse button down and I'm going to pull this downwards and what that has successfully done is completed this series what it's done is taken this one and replicated it all the way down now that's really nice that means that I can put one piece of data in and replicate it let's have a look at that again I've got another one here go to the bottom right hand corner click with the left hand mouse button hold the left hand mouse button down and drag the mouse downwards until I get to where I want and then let go of the mouse button and that occurs there so that's really nice have you noticed this keeps popping up this little box you'll see it quite frequently it's got context related menu options I'm just going to click on the little arrow to the side and I've got fill series so it's done something called copy cells that's the option that's been ticked but I've actually got fill series let's see what that does now what this has done is it's recognized that there is a gap that it's decided to increment these numbers by one each time so instead of selecting the cells and then on that menu option that's there this one here instead of leaving it as copy cells I can do fill series and it will fill them all in but I don't have to do a whole series of ones and then do that I could click hold the mouse button down select two cells just like we did before let go of the mouse button now go to the bottom right hand corner click again hold the mouse button down and then slowly bring the mouse down because the first two numbers I had were in a sequence Excel I've just let go of the mouse button has recognized that there's a gap of one between these and it's then completed the series that means that I can choose something like one and three which is a gap of two between it and it replicates that further I've also got one to nine here a gap of eight and it will replicate that as well I don't have to just do this with numbers here's a date and I can pull the date down and it's changed all the days of the week now I might not want the days of the week well let's look at this menu again now it's recognized as a date and it's done fill series but it did fill days I've now told it to fill months so it's changed the decision and it's changed it to the months have changed or I could tell it to fill years and it's changed the years for me so this little menu is worth looking at and exploring there are other options available to us for example let's do the one two again I'm going to select them like I did last time but this time though I do go to the bottom right hand corner of both cells you can see it there little square I'm now going to right click and hold the right hand mouse button down and now I'm going to continue down I'm now going to let go I'm now given options before it populates there is the fill series again but look at this I've got growth trend if I just simply say fill series that's going to do a linear trend one two three four as we did in the one three five seven and the one nine seventeen but let's have a look at growth trend 
Now, that's noticed that there's a multiple of two here, that there's a growth between here. So it's actually doubling the numbers each time. And so if I choose one and three again, I go to the bottom right, right hand corner, I click the right hand mouse button, hold it down, drag the mouse downwards, get to the bottom, let go of the right hand mouse button, and then choose growth. And I can see it's now doing multiples of three. So I have these options available to me. But what else could I do with this? Well, and actually, there's a lot more we can do with these. But for what we need, we're just going to look at some of the nicer examples. And one of the ones I really like is the fact that I can do this. I've put the word Monday in. I don't have to go down. I can always click. This is left hand mouse button. And I can always pull it to the side. And you can see from the help what's happening. It fills in the days of the week. What about... Well, I don't have to remember how to spell February or anything else. It will do it for me. But we computer scientists are lazy. I, why write January when I can write Jan? And it will repl replicate those. Why write Monday when I can write Mon? and it can replicate those. So there are a number of things I can do with the fill series and the fill series is really good with working with data and it's really good with working with formulae. But you might be sitting there saying well what's a formulae? Well the good news is that's what you're going to find out in the next lesson. I hope that's been useful. See you next time. Okay, so in this lesson, we're going to be looking at formulae. Um, as you can see, I've created a new tab called Creating Formulae. So we've got that and we know we can refer back to this. And we're going to have a look at this as we go through. Now, we've already seen that we can simply put any numbers or any data with any cell. And a cell, as I have said a number of times, can hold one piece of data. That's all it can do. We now want Excel to perform calculations. That's the power of Excel. And all we're seeing at the moment is it holding data. So we want Excel to perform calculations. The way you tell Excel to start doing a calculation, that it's going to do a calculation, the very first thing you put into the cell is the equal sign. Now the equal sign is an instruction to Excel that anything after this is something it needs to do, not simply store, but something it needs to do. So let's do something really simple. Now the star is where I've held down the shift and the eight key, and that's equivalent to our multiplication. In computers, we don't have a clear symbol for multiplication, so the star symbol has become the symbol for multiplication. It's better than putting an X there, that is just a letter. So 2 star 3 is the same as 2 multiplied by 3. Now, for making it easier to read, I've put spaces either side of the multiplication symbol, but that is purely for me to make it easier for me to read it. It has no impact upon the computer at all. I could quite easily have put it like that. And say, it is something I'm used to doing. You can do it, you could ignore it, you could put a space there and then not bother or not bother putting a space and do that. The computer doesn't care. I only do it because once you formally get to a certain size, they can look confusing and putting spaces in helps. So the equal sign is telling Excel to do a calculation. And then I followed it by that calculation. And if I press enter, the calculation is carried out. And the cell displays the result of that calculation. Two times three after all is six. This is where the formula bar becomes useful. Because if I go back to the cell, 
I can still see the 6 but at the top in the formula bar I can see the calculation it's still there so I can actually alter the calculation I notice I didn't put a space there and I traditionally do but again that's down to me that's personal and then I can press enter and it will carry it out while I'm working on the calculation it will appear in the cell again and you can actually work in the cell but why bother when you've got a beautifully long formula bar so let's look at another one there's 2 plus 3 now the plus symbol the addition symbol is exactly what we expect it to be and we do that by doing the shift and the equals symbol the equals is next to your backspace key which in turn is just above your enter key so 2 plus 3 and by no surprise we will get 5 now we've got 2 minus 3 so the computer can do subtraction and again the minus symbol is exactly the same as we've learnt in mathematics so there's no change there and that is simply the key next to the equals key no shift now needed and if I press enter I get minus 1 2 minus 3 is minus 1 and at this point I wish I hadn't chosen the numbers 2 and 3 simply because we know we're going to end up with a rather nasty fractional number but that's fine we can do that this is division the division sign we do use in mathematics like this there is no line with two dots that we can use this is the only division sign that we have so we can do that quite nicely and that gives us the horrible fraction that I was talking about but it's fine notice Excel has made it fit into the cell so it's rounded it up to this 7 there if I extend the cell then it will add a few more and I could always increase the accuracy but why would I bother anyway we're there so I can perform simple mathematical functions using a formula simply using the equal sign and then the maths my only question is why would I after all I know what 2 times 3 is it's 6 and I might not want to remember that but I could do that in the calculator and then everything would be fine so why bother am I just going to use this enormous spreadsheet simply to do calculations that I could do on the calculator and obviously the answer is there's more to it than this but those fundamental calculations are really useful so what else can I do well now let's put some numbers in just box standard data I'm just going to put the numbers 1 2 3 4 5 and what I could do is I can do equals and I can say equals and then I can either use the mouse to click on this cell with the 1 in it and notice what happens equals C11 that's the cell reference of the cell that's now got what's called the ants going around they're just showing us that this is the cell we're talking about C11 so that is now saying oh okay yep that's fine no problems at all I'm looking at that cell there and I could simply say plus 3 oh that's really exciting I've said 1 plus 3 and it's told me it's 4 oh, so what's the benefit of that well let's do the next one equals that minus 1 well we've got again cell reference C 12 minus 1 is 1 2 minus 1 is 1 that's very impressive but so what okay I'm going to use the arrow key on my keyboard and I can still go to the cell next so I can either use the mouse or the arrow keys on my keyboard it doesn't matter and what I'm going to do here is multiply that by 5 
and then obviously the next one is a division um, however I do this this one's going to look a bit weird but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to this cell here and I'm going to do equals this cell divided by this cell so I've clicked on two cells and notice the one with the ants on it is the last cell I clicked on and it's got a different border different color the first border was blue and that was true in all our cases and the cell reference in the address in the formula is also blue but the second for uh, second cell reference is C14 so the second cell reference is in red and that is also in red it's showing us that we can quickly glance at these and see how they fit into our formula so I'm using two cell references so I'm now doing five divided by four let's press enter 1.25 but so what could I not have done those on the calculator yes but what if I change this number let's change it to seven instantly the answer in here is changed this cell is now not doing one plus three but seven plus three if I change this to five I've now got five minus one which is four this cell was three times five but I could now put 20 in there and find that 20 times five is a hundred and I can change either of these numbers let's change this one to 9 and instantly it changes and if I change that to 18 I stop getting a horrible number in the cell there because it's now doing 18 divided by 9 so what I've now got is I've got the capability of recalculating things based upon the values I'm putting in as these values change these values change as well the cell references means it's only looking at the contents of that cell not saying the number in there is always going to be the number I'm going to use I can change the contents and the formula will recalculate a new result that's the power of formulae that I can use one or two cell references or more and calculate a complex series and undertake a complex calculation and it will constantly recalculate that result as I alter the numbers now that's much more powerful than the calculator where you'd have to keep adding where you'd have to keep recalculating re-entering all the data into your calculator okay so we've looked momentarily at creating formulae and that works really nicely what we're going to do now in the next video is look at using formulae and the autofill function see you in the next video hi again congrats on getting this far i hope you're enjoying the course and already see great results if you want to check out the extended version of the course, head to skillademia.com where you will find our full Excel beginner to advanced course with more than 100 lectures and many more projects to complete. Now, let's continue. Okay, so in this video we're going to be looking at formulae and the autofill. Uh, I've already created a worksheet called Relative Addressing and I've even put some data in. Just as a reminder, the autofill is simply by clicking on the first cell we're interested in, holding the mouse button down and dragging it over the second one so we get the pattern. Excel is looking for the pattern between those two numbers. We then go to the bottom right hand corner, click, hold the mouse button down and drag down slowly until we get to where we want and we can let go. Excel will then auto fill all the other numbers for us. Another way of doing that is to click on the number, the single number you want, go to the bottom right hand corner again, but this time hold down the right hand mouse button. Drag that downwards, 
it's showing one in the help bar but as soon as I let go it then offers me to copy cells which is the one or fill series if I go to fill series it then recognizes that it needs to increment by one so I get the same result so I could now do a formula that simply says equals that times three let's say but what if I want to multiply all these cells by three well that's easy enough I now click on there there's the formula up in the bar there there's the result of the calculation I can now go to the bottom corner and drag this downwards when I let go it's now not doing simply B3 times 3 but if I go from the B3 so if I go from our first calculation to the one below it B3 becomes B4 if I click in the formula bar though I originally told it to look at cell B3 and multiply it by 3 when I auto filled downwards Excel incremented increased by one the cell reference so it's now B4 and the blue box is showing me that and the next one is B5 and down here is B12 that is called relative addressing it's relative when I pull this down Excel is using the next address relative to the next one the reference here was altered by one cell because this cell is one cell away from the original this cell here has incremented by nine because it's nine cells away from the original cell now I've got another sequence of numbers here and I've got my calculations and there's nothing wrong with me doing something like this saying I want to have C3 and I'm going to divide it by that number so I'm using the formula from before in a new formula 3 divided by 1 is 3 if I now drag that downwards they're all 3 so I've got this calculation and I'm dividing them by here so this calculation is using that number there that raw value that raw data this formula here is using this raw number on this side but a formula on that side so a formula can reference a formula and we get a nice calculation and the autofill means that I don't have to worry I can now alter these numbers if I wanted to and this will auto calculate equally I can change these numbers and both formally will update it will change everything in both cells so the autofill function is incredibly powerful it allows me to write one formula and then replicate it down using relative addressing and that works beautifully that's how we are lazy in computer science we don't want to write 10 formally when I can write one or in this case two formally and I only have to write those two to get 20 of them out I've also got a block of numbers here equals I don't have to just work an autofill vertically I can also do it horizontally equally I wanted to show that I can do more complex formally let's just look at this so we're doing n2 I'm going to multiply it by n3 and then I'm going to add n4 14 so I've got n2 times n3 4 times 3 plus the 2 now I can pull that this way and Excel is following my instructions throughout each calculation being there
But let's look at something else. I'm now going to do 4 plus 3 multiplied by 2. So this is going to do 4 plus 3 multiplied by 2. 4 plus 3 is 7 multiplied by 2. I should get 14. But I got 10. Well, OK. What's the calculation? The top number plus the second number multiplied by the third number. So I've got in this column here, I'd have 10 plus 5. So that's 15 times 3. 45. So let's just make sure we get 45. None of the results are showing correctly. Why is that? Well, hopefully you remember the rules in school of bid mass or bod mass. That is, and I'm going to use Excel to help it, I prefer bid mass, though I was taught bod mass, and that is that way. around that is brackets then this is why I prefer it indices that's to the power of or square roots division multiplication addition and subtraction now this is the order in which things are processed it's actually important to remember that division and multiplication are one and the same. So they are equal. They are done in order of being encountered. So if division comes before multiplication when you're reading left to right, division will be done first. But if multiplication comes first when you read left to right, then multiplication will be done first. The same thing is true with addition and subtraction. However, if your addition comes before your multiplication, for example, as we've got here, bid mass applies. That means multiplication is carried out first. This is not doing 4 plus 3 times 2. This is doing 3 times 2, which is 6, plus 4, because the rules of bid mass are being applied throughout. If I wanted to change that calculation, if I want to do the addition first, then I have to re remember the ultimate part of this rule, brackets. So if what I'm trying to do comes after the operation, then I need to use the brackets to help me. That is, I'm going to go to the formula bar, click in the formula bar, put a brackets. Now be very careful. Sometimes when you move the arrow key, Excel won't move the cursor, but it will instead move one of the boxes. Now because I'm going into the formula here, that's fine, but it will you will find times when you think, "Oh, I'll go back over the formula." I'll show you a mo an instance of that in a moment. You move the arrow key and it changes the cell reference. So my advice is when you're working on formulae, don't use the arrow keys. Use your mouse just to select where you want to go. There's the close bracket. Now it's doing 4 plus 3, 12, plus 2, 14. This now, if I replicate, remember this currently is not doing 10 plus 5, 15, times 3, 45. What it's actually doing is 5 times 3, which is 15, plus 10, which is 25. If I now autofill this across, 45 now appears because the brackets comes first before everything else. Indices are to the power. We'll have a look at that much later on and see how we do powers. But that comes after brackets. Now I was saying about the calculations. Let's say I was doing the calculation and I decided I was going to do 4 plus 3 multiplied by 2. And then I realized I didn't want to do plus. I wanted to do minus. So I could use the arrow keys. But notice as I do so, I'm now changing that box. The 
third box is changing. I now am getting my calculation confused. So if I use the arrow keys, I'm now not working in the function. Though I'm typing the function, I'm controlling the cell reference. So it's really important when I'm doing that, I have to now make sure I use the mouse. Now I can either do that in the formula bar or in the cell. As I said before, I recommend doing it in the formula bar simply because it's nice and long. And if I decided to do minus, I could do. And now I'm doing N2 minus N3 times N4, but we know the rules of bid mass, so it's doing N3 times N4, 3 times 2, which is 6, and then it's doing 4 minus 6, which is minus 2 not 6 minus 4. Remember that it's doing 4 minus 6. It does the multiplication first and then it subtracts that from N2. So bid mass is an important thing to remember when working with formulae. Do hope that helps. What we're going to look at is in the next video is a problem with relative addressing and then how we resolve that issue. See you in the next video. So in the last video we looked at relative addressing and that was a really nice way of just taking a value, right clicking on the bottom square, pulling that down, then telling fill series and we get those numbers. Um, we can then, relative addressing was the case of using that cell reference, carrying a out a calculation and then pulling that calculation down using autofill again and in this case it's altering the cell reference and relative to where you started from. By the way, I did want to point out one really nice thing about that series fill and with this calculation fill. So. I could put a 1 there and I can then tell the series, select that column, go to the fill statement up here and go to series and I can just simply leave it as it is. Go down the column, use the linear progression, add 1 every time, click OK and that's filled that number all the way down. If I then take this and I put equals that cell multiplied by 5 for example I can then take that and simply tell it to fill down and you can see my computer's busily trying to work that out and then that runs all the way down so how far does that go? Well I told you there's a million cells so how can I prove that? Well I could scroll down that's going to take a very long time um, one way of doing that is to hold down the control key and push the down arrow key and that's taken us straight to the bottom 1,048,576 there are now no more cells and it's done the calculation all the way down so I can fill this and the fill series will give me that long number of numbers Equally, if I want to go back to the top, control, and the up arrow pushes me back up to the top. Now, that's a little aside. It's a nice thing to have. Let's just clear those because that takes my computer some time to calculate. So we've looked at relative addressing, and we just use relative addressing to do that relative. And what it did was fill series down that relative addressing. That's excellent. So let's say that I wanted to take the number 4, and I want to multiply it, but by each of these numbers I put along here. Well, that's easy. I go to this cell here. I tell it I want to do a calculation. Equals. I say, take this number here, and I want to multiply it by this number here. Now obviously that's going to do 4 times 4 which is 16. So when I pull that across relative addressing is then going to ignore the 4 and instead use the 6 and then the 7 then the 3 then the 4 then the 2. So what we should get here is 6 times 4. Well 6 times 4 is 24 and then 6 times sorry 7 times 
4, which gives me 28, and 3 times 4, which is 12, and 4 times 4, which is 16, and 2 times 4, which is 8. So let's see how we do. I'm going to pull that across. Now, without even knowing the maths, I know, for example, that 2 times 4 is not 16,128. I know that 4 times 6 is not 96, nor none of these are correct. Something has gone wrong. I'm going to check on my first formula. Yeah, that's correct. I wanted to do this 4 times this 4. So in the next cell, I want to do this 6 times this 4. So let's see if I got there. Notice I am using the 6. The relative addressing has worked correctly to go this way, but I'm not using the 4. And if we think about it, that makes sense. The computer has used relative addressing. So as I pull it this way, not only has it changed the cell reference by 1 each time, but it's also changed the cell reference by 1 here. So it's moved the cell reference from H3 to I3, but equally from G4 to H4. So it's gone from those two cells to those two cells. That's a problem with relative addressing. I didn't want this one to change. I wanted it to stay looking at that. So a really quick fix to that is go to this blue box and drag it and put it where I want it. That's a really nice little trick. You didn't see that before. And now that works. And these numbers have changed, but that's because they're all looking at this cell. This one is now looking at this cell. So now what I've got to do is drag this and put it there. And now that one's correct. But these... Oh, and now imagine if I've been doing that with one of those long series. I'm going to put a number 4 there, and I'm going to put a calculation in there that says this multiplied by this. Now what I'm then going to do is I'm going to replicate this all the way down as we did before. So go to series, fill it all the way down. I've got that 1 million now numbers. And what I'm now going to do is take this one and tell this one just to fill down and now what that's doing is it's taking 1 times 4 then 2 times 4 then 3 times no it's not because that relative addressing I wanted this cell to always look at this 4 not bring come down so I've now got to sorry I've now got to that's when you're clicking in the wrong place go to there pull that up and I've got to do that for 1 million cells I'm not doing that. That's just not happening. Surely there's a fix to this. And there is. Let's go back. Remember, with computer science, we are all about being lazy. So what I'm going to do, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo that. And I'm going to put the numbers back I've got there. Then I'm going to undo. So keep clicking undo. And those have gone. That's really nice. I'm going to go back to this cell in a moment. But let's now get rid of these. And let's look at this formula here. Remember, we're trying to be lazy. We want to type one formula and get all of the answers to work when we do an autofill. So we're looking at G4. We don't want this cell to change. What part of it do we not want to change? Well, we don't want it. When we pull it this way, it's going to go from G to H. Let's just look at that again. This is G4. Now it's H4. The 4 has stayed consistent. It's still 4. But the column reference has gone from G to H. And that's what we don't want to have change. So what we do, we go to the front of there, just before the part we don't want to have change, and we put a dollar symbol. Now when I drag that across, it works. And if I click on there, we can see that says G4 with a dollar. 
and that says G4 with a dollar and that says G4 with a dollar and so on all the way to the end similarly here if I do equals this multiplied by this but then I go just before the one because it's going to be R1 then R2 then R3 so it's not the column reference that changes here it's the row reference that changes here so I'm going to lock that row reference by putting the dollar in front of it so think of the dollar as saying lock that column or lock that row here we're locking in that specific row row number one the R can change. It's not going to because we're not pulling it that way. But the R can change if it really wanted to. We're controlling that one. So I'm going to press there. We still get four. I can now go to here. I can now tell it to do a series fill. Click on OK. We now have our one million numbers. I can then go to here. Tell it to fill downwards. And as we can see, it's now filled those all in. You might notice a bit of a jump. That's because that took my computer a long time to calculate all of those values. And I certainly don't want to do that again. But it's now doing four times all of those numbers. If we do a jump to the bottom, hold down the control key and press the down arrow, we can find out that four times 1,048,576 is 4,194,304. There's some useful information for you. So, back to the top. To so help my computer keep running, I'm going to get rid of those by just selecting them and deleting them. And we'll go back to this example here. This dollar locks that part of the formula in place that part of the cell reference in place in this case the column reference if I put a dollar next to the four just this side of the four to the left of the four I will lock in the row reference and there's a really nice little calculation nice little exercise you can do um, and there's a really nice little trick we can do if we wanted to work on that quite nicely. I'm just going to show it with a very simple number. Equals that. There's nothing wrong with having a cell reference reference one piece of data. We can do that quite often. There's good reasons for that. But we'll look at that later on. For now, we've got that. So what I can do is press the F4 key. This is the set of keys at the top of your keyboard marked F1, F2 all the way to F12. F is short for function and you can program these. Excel adds some programming to these keys. F4 is one of them. Notice what happens. I'm just going to select the, the cell reference. I'm going to press F4 and it puts dollar signs each side if I press that F4 again it does it next to the row reference if I press F4 again it puts it next to the column reference and if I press F4 again it removes them all and if I keep pressing it it goes in a cycle all of them row column none of them all of them row column none of them so F4 is a really neat way of quickly doing that in case you can't be bothered or can't click in those areas. But that will work. And if I do all of them and I press enter, then when I pull this cell down, it will just keep saying four because this one is still looking at that cell there, exactly there. So that's locked onto that cell. And it doesn't matter if I pulled that that way this cell here which is now all this way down and all this way across still is looking at that one cell there I can lock it in this is called absolute addressing it's different from the one we looked at over here which is relative addressing and this uses a mixture of relative and absolute here we've just used absolute addressing I hope that's helped in the next video, we're going to be looking back at formatting cells. See you then.
in this video on formatting cells which is something we've partly looked at before um, we're just going to finalize one last pit get our heads around one small section to do so I've created another worksheet remember just clicking on the plus I've named it formatting cells remember just double click and change what's in there to formatting cells uh, I'm now going to go to the button at the top between the column and row references to select the whole sheet and for now I'm going to set the pixel width to 100 I'm going to do the same for the columns I'm going to see how that comes out now on my screen that's come out quite nicely if it's too big and bulky then feel free to adjust those to a smaller dimension and all I'm going to do is grab a 4x4 set of cells so there's the active cell this is my selected cell range um, at the moment it's showing me the active cell and all I'm going to do at the moment is go to the border control that we've looked at before go to more borders and again tell it inside and outside and I could have very easily done that with the other tools but we'll do that I'm going to choose the first cell in the top corner something I can do very nicely now is use the bucket fill command yes I can quite easily let's put some data into there there's a and I've just put the caps lock on B C D by the way just to show you and I'm going to get rid of those let's just select those cells again if I now put a yes it goes the other way but I could always do it that way which really is sorry stop to think about the alphabet there but it really is a neat little thing to do so I've got those goes back to the beginning now I've got them and just to help ourselves along I'm going to center that and center it there I'm going to make them a little bit larger so let's stick them all oh, 36 fits my cells really nicely so there you go so again I'm going to select the first cell here I'm going to go up to the bucket fill symbol here and I'm going to click on that and I get a fill color of yellow which is exactly what I can just about see underneath the bucket but I might not want yellow so I can click on the down arrow next to it and now I've got a range of colors that I can choose from just like we had with the font colors I've got these here so I can change the color the last color selected is the, the option for that bucket fill but I can continuously change those all I like now they're a nice range but I might want more so I've got the option of more colors at the bottom and we've got used to seeing this at the bottom of most menus is a more option that gives us even more control now what we've got here is a color chart and we've got a greater selection of shades of color so I can click there and that gives me that shade there equally with that under custom I can actually either use click in different areas and then vary the intensity so let's go over here if I now vary the intensity of that I get that click on OK and that now becomes the color you could see the original color being displayed underneath current and new if you're happy with the concept of RGB colors then you can define how much red is in there how much green and how much blue every color on your computer is made up of those three colors mixed together red is obviously all red let's just cancel this go over here and then just to show you go to more colors custom so if I set that to 255 which is the maximum value 255 that's all to do with computers and the way they work now because it's got a background of white that's 255 255 255 all the red all the green all the blue so if I set green to zero and I set blue to zero I get 25500 and the red is the only color coming through and there's the red that I would get 
if I instead switch off red notice I've now got no color and no color means I've got a black background if I go to green and I put that 255 then I get an intense green and if I only put blue to 255 I get a nice blue if I don't put it maybe I go almost halfway 124 I get a darker one so the lower the number the darker the shade of that particular color but as I add colors so there's 255 let's go back to the green 128 and it gives me this mild color the more green I put in the more it heads towards cyan so if I now put 255 I get that nice cyan if I ignore that one and put more red in then it heads towards purple and if I do a mixture then I get more intensities I've probably gone too high with that one let's go for 100 and it washes the colors out if I lower the blue now to 200 and you can see 20 I get this brown color you might even notice these hex values before and that's something worth exploring but that's not for us to do in this one so I can fill the background color with an incredibly wide range of colors how many colors well as I say the maximum value of red we've got is 255 the maximum red of uh, sorry number of greens is 255 don't forget one of those values is zero so though the maximum value is 255 we have 256 shades of red no red to all red same thing with green 256 different shades of green from no green to all green and the same thing with blue so the maximum value is 255 but the number of colors number of shades is 256 so let's just use Excel to help us here red there are sorry put that in capitals to make it stand out and we go for green and we go for blue there are 256 shades of red there are 256 shades of green and there are 256 shades of blue now if I have all the shades of red then I can quite simply I then can multiply that by the number of green because I can use 0 or 1 or 2 and 256 times 1 and, and so on so what I can do is multiply that by the 256 to see how many different combinations of red and green there are but obviously I've got blue as well so I can do multiply by that because the number of colors is the number of shades of red multiplied by the number of shades of green multiplied by the number of shades of blue how many different combinations are there of me giving red green and blue if there's 256 different values of each and the answer is 16.7 million different shades different colors so using that system gives us 16.7 million colors I think that's enough for us to fill our grid up nicely and there's certain nice little tricks we can do here for example if I set this as black then notice I now can't see the letter because the foreground the font color is the same as the background color that's obvious the nice thing is I can do that with red if I select the red and I tell the font to do the same I lose the text it's still there I can see that in the formula bar but anyone looking at my cells won't see that they'll just see the color so matching foreground or font color to background does sometimes make it more presentable with your data your data still there but they don't need to see the values so that's formatting cells in the sense of filling them with color and that becomes nice and useful in the next revision exercise using the times table square and that's where we're going in the next video so see you in the next video
okay so we ended the last video um, looking at formatting cells and I've still got the lesson open uh, what I want to do is go file save then file close once it's closed I then want to go to file and I want to find the times table square that we were looking at before open that up and if you remember that's where we got to with our grid system and what we're going to do is we're going to use first of all the autofill to simply fill some numbers in here so I'm just going to put one and then go there and right click pull that down to there and simply tell it to fill series I'm going to do the same thing there one click away click back bottom right hand corner hold down the, re uh, the right hand mouse button pull across let go of the mouse button click on fill series I've got those there I'm then going to center these nicely and bold them and increase the font simply by using that button until I get a nice font size I can see that's font size 16 I'm going to do the same thing here select all those center center bold and then increase it to size 16 so I've got that nice balance there so we've got a nice look there now we want to separate these numbers which we're going to use to do calculations from these ones here that we're going to do the calculations with so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select those again I'm going to do the bucket fill and I'm going to choose a shade of something there you go a yellow and I'm going to do the same thing here I'm going to choose a different shade just to show I can and I've got that there so we've got the beginnings of our times table square and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use this cell here to start to do the calculation and this is a times table square and you might remember these from school and all we're going to do is multiply this one by this one so simply enough equals this cell I've used my mouse to click multiplied by remember that's shift 8 this cell here and press enter now we can see that the numbers down the bottom so I'm going to select all of these because we're going to use all of them and I'm going to tell it to be centered I'm not going to bold but I am going to take up to 16 so that these stand out now what we're going to do is do the fill series so all we're going to do is grab that bottom right hand corner and drag downwards now we can see the hash marks and as I said before those hash marks aren't an error as such it's saying the numbers are too great for that particular cell and if we look that seems to work one times one is one and one times two is two but as soon as we get to the three we've got the one times three is six so let's have a look at what's happening we're doing this we can see the blue boundary b3 times c2 and if we go down to this cell we can see that though the result looks correct it's multiplying the wrong thing we're multiplying correctly by this cell but instead of multiplying by c2 it's moved down to c3 due to that relative addressing problem so what's changed and this is the hardest part with working this part out identifying what is changed and what you need to lock what you need to make absolute so we're at c2 but we've gone to c3 so we can see that the three has changed the two has changed to a three so if we now go back to the original there's the c2 the two changed to a three so we need to put a dollar in front of that remember I could press f4 I've just typed it it doesn't make much difference now if I drag that down and fill series all the way down it's correct 1 times 10 is 10 and if we look it's locked into that cell but allowed this one to move so you should only use absolute addressing to absolutely lock in what you want don't lock in things you don't need to lock just to see how that goes okay now what else can we do well now let's drag this this way 
Now again, we've got the same error because this time we've got the B3 times C and locked two, but let's see what's happening here. The B3 has become C3, so the B has changed to the C, and that's happened all the way through, and we can see that we've got an error there. So we need to go back to the original, and in this case, look at the B for the first reference and lock that in place with the dollar. We've now got two locked absolute references, absolutely column B, but row three, that can change. Column C can change, but absolutely row two. How does that help us? Well, now what I can do is I can pull that formula down. Remember, I've got one formula here. In fact, what I'm going to do, just to show you, I'm going to delete all of the existing formulae. And what I'm going to do is go to that one and I'm going to drag it down just as we did before. We know this works unless that dollar B has broken it. That should work and it still does. There's no reason for that to have not worked because the B3 has worked. Now, if we'd locked the three, that would have broken it, but we haven't. It's still looking at column B and that's perfectly fine. But what I'm now going to do is rather than go back up to the top and pull across, I'm simply going to grab the handle down here at the bottom and drag across. So I've only actually had to drag down and then I can do all cells. There are a hundred cells here. Two drags will create a hundred cells. And I've now got a times table square that works. And the cool thing about this is we've only used one formulae. We have only used one set of calculations, set it up correctly, and that has successfully completed all of these for us. So we now have our times table square. Our times table square is in place. There's things we'd like to do to sort out this times table square, make it a little bit easier to work with, uh, and we're going to reconstruct it in a way just to get certain colors sorted and lay it out better. But that's for the next revision exercise, not for now. So, see you in the next video. So in this lesson, we're gonna be looking at how to protect a worksheet. To do that, I've reopened my lessons spreadsheet. I'm going to click on the plus, so I've created a new sheet. Double click, and we're going to call this Protecting Worksheets. Then what I'm going to do is go to the top left hand corner, select the whole sheet and I'm going to alter the global column width to 50 and then the global row height to 50 as well. None of that should be new, we've done that a few times now. Now I'm going to choose um, some cells, so I've chosen C3 and I'm going to put a border around C3. And then I'm going to do the same thing here with E3. And finally here with G3. Now I want this all to stand out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the whole sheet again. And I'm going to fill the background completely black. Now I've got to remember where my cells are at the moment. I'm going to click on cell B2, hold the mouse button down and drag across. Now I know I got to G3. So I'm going to H4, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to fill this with a light yellow. Now what I'm going to do is, what I want to have happen is I'm going to get the user to put a number in there and put a number in there and then the result will come here. The result of what? Well, we're going to put an X in here. I'm then going to center that X and I'm going to enlarge it. And I'm going to put an equal sign in here. Now, 
Here's a fun thing with Excel. If I want to use the equal sign within the text, if I press enter, it doesn't know quite what to do. So the way sometimes to get around that problem is to put a single quote mark and then the equals. Then Excel absolutely knows what to do. It knows it's now text. So I'm now going to place that where I need it to be. Now, as you saw, when I put the equal sign, it accepted it as an equal sign. But if I put equals with anything after it, it would have treated it as a calculation. So it's better to be safe than sorry. That single quote, which you can now see in the formula bar, tells Excel that this is all text. Ignore whatever, anything else you think, it's text. So just checking on my X, my X is 18. So I'm going to increase this to size 18. Now I'm using the increase button, but I could quite easily have selected it off of this drop down list. It would have done the same thing. I want the answer to come here and I want it to be quite apparent it's different to everything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change its color to that light blue. This is where I want the user to put their data into. So I'm going to make that really clear by setting this to white. And same thing with this. So we've got a series of cells now where we could put people and put numbers in. And it's really easy. We're going to do this times this. So all I'm going to do is put this, click on this cell here, do the star symbol, and then click on this cell here. I'm going to press enter and obviously there's nothing in there there's nothing in there rather than Excel generate an error it calculated a zero let's make sure that that is 18 and that is also centered now we haven't put anything into here but we could do our calculation works we want to make sure that those are centered and those are also 18 but it works but notice I can click anywhere. There's nothing to force me to put any data there and I could quite easily go to the formula and see the formula. And I don't want them to do that. I don't want the user to be able to do that. I want them to just enter data there and there. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to take this cell first. I'm going to use my right hand mouse button and I'm going to go down to an option that says Format Cells. Now we've not really talked about this menu, but this menu is called a context menu. That means that everything you see on this menu is related to what you have clicked on. It is in context. Unlike the menus at the top, which are general, they are there and they might gray out and everything else, but you'll see them. The only things you'll see when you right click is related to whatever you've right clicked on. And so in this case, one of the things that makes sense is that I can format the cells. Now we've seen this before. We saw number, we used alignment, we've used the font, we've looked at the border control and we've used the fill. What we've never used is the protection. And notice that every cell you click on is protected. It's got a locked, uh, it's got a locked marker ticked to tell you that this cell is locked well clearly it's not locked because I can click on it but it tells you locking cells or hiding formulas has no effect until you protect the worksheet which is what we're going to do in a moment but I don't want this cell to be protected this is the one I don't want to have locked so I'm going to remove the tick so by default cells are locked so you need to choose the cells that you don't want to have locked. So again, gone to that one, right clicked, format cells, protection, remove the tick, click OK. Now we're ready. So I can still click everywhere. Every single cell is approachable, but these two are now unlocked. I'm going to click over here just so we can see that that's there. I'm now going to go to the review ta uh, tab. I'm going to go to protect sheet. Now what I've got is allow all users of this worksheet to and I've got select locked cells or select unlocked cells. 
I can also allow them to format cells or do lots of other things. But at the moment, all I want them to do is put a number into these. So all I'm going to let them do is keep the tick, uh, the tick, allow all users of this worksheet to select unlocked cells. And if I really want to protect this, I can enter a password in here. I'm not going to, no, in fact we will do. Let's put the word password in. There you go. Remember, the most important thing to do, and I really mean this, is to remember the password. If you are one of those people that easily forgets them, make sure you write this down somewhere because it's really difficult to remove it once it's in place. So now I've got that. This says protect worksheet and contents of locked cells. I've got this in place at the moment. The password is password, all lowercase. I'm going to click on, that's a really bad password by the way, but we will, we'll let it go now. And I'm going to click on OK. I'm going to re-enter password. It's guaranteeing I'm not being foolish. So password. And if I forget this, if you lose or forget the password, it cannot be recovered. It's really warning you and it is incredibly difficult to remove them. So we click on OK. Notice I had a cell selected over here, but now it's jumped to there. I can't click over here. I can't click anywhere except there and there. I can try all I like. I can try to select columns. I can try to select rows. None of it works. But I can click in there and I can change the number. And when I press the tab key, that's the key on the left hand side above your caps lock. That's got an arrow, two arrows, one point in the left, one point to the right, and they're pointing towards a brick wall in all intents and purposes. And that's a good way of jumping from cell to cell. And I can change that and now I've got myself a rather simple calculator. So that's how you lock cells. That's how you protect the worksheet. How do you unprotect it? Well, I go to unprotect. This asks me for the password. Click on OK. And now I can get to the sheet. I can now click anywhere I like. How do I protect it? I go back to there, password's gone, I have to reissue the password and I can set what I want people to be able to do. So I'm going to cancel that now, we've got that, we've seen how to protect this sheet, in fact we will end by not putting a password in but simply clicking on OK and now this sheet is protected. In the next video we're going to be looking at how to restrict data in cells. See you in the next video. In starting this lesson off, I've already created the relevant worksheet. So obviously we're talking about restricting data in cells. And I've done nothing else. We ended up on the protecting worksheet but this time what I want to do is I want to show how we can force users to use the data we want them to. So what I can do here is I can go to data I've selected the cell at the moment B2 that's perfectly fine and I'm going to go across to an option that says data validation. There is an extension of this and I've got a few other areas I can look at, but we only want data validation, so that's perfectly fine. When I've got data validation, I've given only one real option, allow any value. That's the default. So Excel always uses validation in many ways, but the validation is any value. So I'm going to click on the down arrow and I can then tell it what I want to restrict the data to. So I might say, well, I only want it to be a whole number. And I might want to restrict what that whole number is between. So I might decide that it's got to be between 1 and 100. Now I know in that cell, I can put any of those values in there that I like. 
we'll do an extreme test. An extreme test is where you test the system for values that are at the edge of any boundary. So we said that the user cannot enter any number that's not between 1 and 100. So our boundary is 1 and 100. And they work. So any number between those two will. What about 0? Oh, now we get an error message. This value doesn't match the data validation restriction defined for this cell. Well, that's so helpful. Thank you. What does that mean? Well, I can cancel or retry, and you can see that what I put in doesn't work. Let's put 101. As soon as I press enter, I get that little ding, and the error message comes up again. It's not very helpful, that error message. I can also be silly and try to put the word cat in, but obviously it's going to reject that. So it's only accepting numbers between 1 and 100. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go back to the validation rule. We've defined this and input message. So what we've got here is the ability to tell the user what they need to put into this cell. I can enter a title, enter a number. I must enter an input message otherwise it won't work. So enter a number between 1 and 100. I'm going to click on OK and you can see instantly there it is. It's appeared there. So I've got my nice message telling me what to do. But what if I still decide to enter 101? Well, I'm going to get this really weird message. So I'm going to go back to data validation. I've actually got an error alert option. That tells me to stop so I can choose which one I want. Incorrect value. The value you entered was either too low, below 1, or too high, above 100. Please try again. Click OK. Now when I'm on there, click in the cell, I get the little help box. But if I do decide to enter something wrong, now my error message comes up. So I'm helping to restrict the data that is put into that cell. I'm helping to limit what someone uses in there. And I'm not just tied to whole numbers. Let's just switch off my error message and let's switch off my input message for now. So I could restrict it to a decimal value or a date or a time or a particular length. So I could say that the text length, they must enter a save for a password, something between 8 and 16 characters long. Um, I've got custom, so I can define what I want based upon a formula. And there's one called list. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next lesson. So I left you last lesson looking at this data validation option and I said we're going to look at lists. So first of all before I do, I'm just going to delete what we've got there. I'm going to choose a new cell just for no apparent reason and I'm going to go to data validation again. In this case I'm going to go to list and I need a source for that list. So I'm going to go over here and let's give a source for that list. If I go back to that cell I can do data validation and say list and tell it to use a source for that list. Now to do so I need to click on this item here and then I can select that there. I'm then going to press enter and click on OK you'll immediately see I've got a small drop down symbol there and the numbers are there. So I can restrict the user to those numbers. Now obviously I typed 1 to 10 in but there's no reason why I can't do a full series to do that. The only thing is I can see that list. Now I potentially could move that to a different sheet couldn't I? So let's have a look. 
I'm going to go to add a new sheet. I'm going to add, put a number one in. I'm going to select it. Let's drag it down to there and let's do a fill series. Let's go back to our list. Let's do data validation. Click on the arrow to choose our list and go to sheet number four. And sure enough, I can select it. So I could potentially hide the values I'm using by having a different worksheet elsewhere. When I click on OK, I can click there and now I've got all the numbers that I want them to be able to select from. And that's quite neat and quite nice to be able to do. The other thing you can do is hide some of the data and we've already seen one way of hiding the data. But another way of doing that, if you remember with the context menu I showed you last time, if we go to this column here, I can actually right click and choose hide and it will hide the column for me. So I can hide it. Now have a look. The letters still work. I, K. Now you'll know that J should be there. So all if, if all I want to do is bring that back, all I have to do is click, hold, drag to select all the columns either side of the hidden one, right click and choose unhide and there it is as if by magic it's back. Now I've lost a uh, lovely cell, there it was in G5, because there's no way of defining it, seeing it, until I'm clicked into it. So obviously our pretty border tool helps us enormously recognize data goes there, oh there's a drop down, I'm going to put a number in there and clearly something's gone wrong. We've got the error validation rule again, so there's nothing stopping me from going back to the data validation tool, so data, data validation. I can then put in the error alert and that's not a problem at all. Okay, so I'm hoping that helps. It's nice little short thing to work with uh, and we're going to be using that when we get back to the times table square project. But in the next exercise we're just going to look very quickly at one of the things that we might want to be able to do which is add and delete columns and rows. So see you in the next video. Okay so in this video which is going to be relatively short we're going to look at adding and deleting columns and rows and that doesn't seem to be that complex but in doing so, I want to have a look at something else. So just as a reminder of what we did last, we looked at the data validation rule and we created a list that looked at sheet four and it looked at these specific cells. F4, you can see that dollar by the way. So Excel by default, default uses absolute addressing F4 to F24. So we should remember that. It's worth remembering for those F4 to F24. But the main thing I think we're going to need is, well, we'll remember those. Let's go back to sheet four, which is where that data was. Now we're going to use this for adding and deleting columns and rows. So just double click on there and I'm going to call this adding and deleting. So that's fine. I've got there. By the way, you, you will notice that we're creating one for every lesson. And now we've got so many tabs that we can't see the first one. So we've got a double, triple uh, dot there, which we can keep clicking on. But we've also got these controls, which allows you to push either way. But let's go back to our adding and deleting. So there's our adding and deleting. There's our F4, our nice column there. But let's suggest that we wanted to insert a row. So all we've got to do, remember that context menu, go to a row, right click and choose insert. Now you'll notice that it appeared to insert the row below the one that we've selected. But let's just have a look at that. I'm going to click there again and I'm going to put in a border. So we've got a nice border in row two. I'm going to click in row two, right click and 
insert and we can see that in fact what's happened is it's inserted it at row 2 and brought it down let's just see what happens if I insert row 4 if I insert row 4 then I get a nice clean row there I can also do a selection of rows just like that so I can do insert and it will create three new rows exactly where I created them so that works really nicely I can clearly do the same thing with the columns right click to get that contextual member uh, menu choose insert and it will insert them the same must be true for selecting a range right clicking and then instead of choosing insert to choose delete and that deletes them I should be able to do the same thing with the rows select a whole range of them in fact something you can do if you remember you can hold down the control key and select not just the rows you wanted sorry the, the rows in a range but the only the ones you wanted now can I delete those right click I've got delete on the context menu so let's delete and sure enough it's got rid of them so you can delete the rows and columns that you would like so why did I show you the list thing well because it was called sheet 4 and it was started this set of cells started at F4 I have now moved this to D it starts at D6 how has that affected our data here well let's go and have a look at the validation rule Excel has made sure it keeps understanding of that so we haven't got to go back through everything and change it everything we're doing is being monitored by Excel Excel's checking that what you're doing is okay and does it affect anything else and it will either report an error if you do or give you a warning or it will do what it's just done which is simply resolve the problem for you so that's really nice so that's adding and deleting columns it helps reconfirm this context menu that comes here yes there are other ways of inserting columns and rows if we have a look at the home option we've got them here insert cells insert sheet columns we can even insert a sheet we can do the same thing here delete cells delete sheet columns or delete the sheet but it's more complex and takes a little bit longer to find the menu options that are here rather than use the context menu by right clicking hopefully that's helped in the next lesson we're going to look at something a little bit more venturesome conditional formatting see you then For this lesson on conditional formatting I've obviously created a new tab called conditional formatting and I've resized the columns and the rows to 50 pixels. I've then selected C2 all the way to M5 and used the all borders option under borders to just give us a clear area to work with him. Now we've been used to the idea of using our font and border color our fill colors and our borders and everything else and setting the format and that's fine if I wanted that cell to be a uh, blue I just click on blue and it is blue but sometimes and I'm just going to use the undo sometimes we wanted to format based upon a condition so let me give you an example let's use the numbers I'm just going to fill series that to there so fill series and then let's just take that down to there fill series so we've got those now let's suggest that we want to color all numbers between the numbers 5 and 10 just to get an idea of where they are well I could go through individually coloring, coloring them but another way of doing that is to use this tool here called the conditional formatting tool and there's a 
many options under here you can see that it's not an, a single option with a drop down but it's purely a drop down and each one has its own se uh, selection group under there the most common usage for this is to use the manage rules now if we use the new rules the new rule option it triggers one of the factors of manage rules similarly with the clear rules uh, option these are fantastic and when we get onto those much later on you'll understand how to use them but for this for this stage let's use the manage rules option now as i say the new rules option is part of this system notice it's saying current selection so i can see the conditional formatting for the group that i have selected what i'm going to do is i'm going to select new rule in selecting new rule we're taken to the new formatting rule now if we have a look we've got a number of options here we've got format all cells based on their values and that would seem to be what we're looking for I said we wanted to have a format that identified the numbers between 5 and 10 the thing is is that though this does it actually will apply the rule to the whole range and anything below five will maintain the color of five that's a little bit confusing but basically it's not what we want because this will color all cells give them all the format those outside our upper and lower boundaries five and ten will simply continue the color that five and ten receive I suppose an example is useful there let me set the number for the minimum value set it type to number and set it to five let's set the maximum value to a number and that's going to be 10. let's change the minimum color so the minimum values color we're going to change let's say to green and the maximum value color we're going to alter to blue so what it's going to do is it's going to shade from this green right across to this blue from accepting this lowest end of the green is five and the upper end of this blue is ten so everything in between will be a shade but any value below five will simply stay with the color that five has received and any value above 10 will continue with the value of 10 there and to prove that if I click on OK and then apply that's what we've got we can see it shading from 5 to 10 but everything above 10 has maintained the same blue same with 5 everything below 5 has maintained the same green that's not what we wanted so what I'm going to do is delete that rule I'm going to create a new rule by the way just on that just apply gets rid of the format so let's go back to new rule the next option down says format only cells that contain now this is actually the traditional one that Excel has always had cell value is between 5 and 10 and we can do a format and we can set the fill color to let's say cyan click OK click OK click apply now we have what we set out to do we set out to highlight only the ones that we wanted we haven't done the scale but we have been able to operate it in this way so what about the other options well if we click on new rule so we don't rule out the one we've got we had a look at this format all cells based on their values and recognize that if I set a minimum value then anything below maintains the same color that we define and anything above the maximum value maintains the color defined there we've seen how we can use the format only cells that contain rule we can then use format only top or bottom ranked values so it will only color those that are the bottom or the top of the values we've got similarly we can highlight those only above or below the average so the system will calculate if we're above 
or below or equal or above or equal or below or one standard deviation above so we can actually get Excel to highlight values that are above our average or below our average or equal to the average or using standard deviation there's a number of things that we can format there this one here will identify duplicates that means numbers or data that is exactly the same or unique so no other copy of that will appear now clearly in my data range they would all be colored in because well almost all we've only got 14 once and we've only got one once so if I set that rule then what would happen let's go for duplicates let's format that let's make that red click on OK click on OK now what we've now got is two rules I'm going to apply them and you can see that this rule is taking precedence and this one doesn't seem to have uh, what I'm going to do now is move that one up and then apply and you can see that this rule is being applied above that one this is layering of rules so the rule at the top will appear and has precedence over this one imagine that basically it processes from the bottom upwards so it does the one at the bottom and then overrides it with the next one up so rule applied in order shown so that's the probably the best way of seeing it this one was applied duplicate values uh, values um, and valids you can have whatever you like uh, that was applied across the whole lot but this one takes precedence so this is applied next and that's therefore being shown there so we have a number of options available to us and we can see that 1 and 4 14 aren't being applied to and we can use the same rule so I'm going to use the same unique so unique and duplicate but this time I'm going to do the unique and what we'll do with that one is make that a yellow click on OK click on OK click apply and now everything's a pretty color so what's really important with this is we're applying a condition a, a format based upon a given condition well why is that useful well the rule here is that it's got to be between 5 and 10 so what if I made that one 17 well 17 is unique so the rule for 17 is now being applied the unique one is being applied to 17 so as I change the numbers the format changes the format is conditional upon the value that is being displayed if the value changes the condition might change because the format is conditional upon the value and that's the point so conditional formatting is a really useful tool it's a really interesting tool and it can help enormously in the next video we're going to have a look at one of our very first functions see you in the lesson Okay, so in this lesson, we're going to be looking at what's called the mod function. And we're actually going to look at two functions, but the mod function is the one that I want you to retain knowledge of at this point. So what is a function? Well, let's do some recapping. You can see that I've done a new sheet called mod function. I've resized the columns and rows to 50 pixels wide by 50 pixels high and then I've used the border tool to put a series of boxes in I've put the equal sign remember quote then equals same thing will happen with some of these symbols you might notice I've used our traditional division sign and our multiplication sign is actually a multiplication sign how have I achieved that well if I click over here I can then go to insert and right over the side here with the Greek symbol there I've got a symbol list and if I simply look along the bottom I've got multiplication and division but these are under recently used symbols so you can see quite a few of the symbols that I've used recently if you can't see it in the recently used then simply scroll through the list that is here now again there's a divide there if the symbol you want isn't present 
then and you can see I'm scrolling through them then what's happening is I'm slowly going through these are all the different font faces and I've got a list of different categories we started at basic Latin at the top and you scroll down there's the addition sign there's a subtraction sign there's the original divi uh, division sign that we're not using on this occasion and as I say you can uh, scan through for what you're looking for there's the multiplication sign and there's a the division sign but if the sign you're looking for isn't there you can always either jump further down to the list and there's lots of them all there or you can use a, a font face that you know contains that but all I've done is use the times and the division sign there use the standard keyboard plus and minus copied so I took that and on my keyboard I held down the control key and tapped C but equally you could right click and choose copy off the context menu and then go down to there and either use the control V to paste or right click and choose paste which will be available just to show you that it will be available copy down to there right click paste I do have a number of options that simply paste it as is and that's perfectly fine uh, I've got the dancing ants going around that's showing me that's still selected in Excel to stop that simply press the escape key top left of your keyboard so I've got multiply divide add subtract a divide again seems a bit weird but let's start at the top here clearly what I want to do is multiply this with this so I'm simply going to start off the formula equals this star that and press enter this is nothing more than the division so equals again this divided by using the divide key on the keyboard and that and press enter now it's going to complain because I've got nothing in this box just to solve that I'm going to put a one in there and that lets me bring this back I'm doing one divided by zero oh, sorry zero divided by one if you're not too sure why you can't divide anything with zero it doesn't make sense so it doesn't work here I'm going to do equals that plus that and hopefully we're now used to the idea that the equal sign tells the computer you're going to do something that minus that and that we're used to the idea that the result appears in the cell and the formula can be seen up in the formula bar there so that's really handy this looks like it's going to be a division but there's this R left over so first of all let's put some values in here let's do 3 times 4 and we get our 12 let's get our 9 divided by 3 and we get 3 let's now put in let's say 6 plus 2 and in here we're going to do 6 minus 2 just to see what those are here I want to have a look at, at this calculation again but I'm not interested in this part here let me let me try and show you what I don't want to have happen if I put 2 in there then I get a fractional response 4.5 I don't want that so what I'm going to do I'm going to alter the calculation so what I'm going to do is something called an integer division what that means is I'm going to take the 9 and the 3 as we've got above and I want to divide it but I want to divide it in such a way that the only thing this box returns is how many times that number goes into there ignoring any fractional part now obviously 3 goes into 9 nice and cleanly it goes into 9 three times so whatever I'm going to do is going to give me 3 but that's fine so I'm going to start this off with the equal sign and now I'm going to not just use mathematics but a built-in function inside Excel and Excel's got a quite, a, quite a few of these what I'm going to write is quotient it's just there the, the third one down quotient and double click and that offers it to me I'm going to 
do the numerator that's the number at the top which is the 9 comma the number at the bottom the denominator there I'm then going to close the brackets now I haven't got to do any mathematics as such all I'm doing is I want the quotient of 9 divided by 3 I'm going to press enter and I get 3 but obviously I got 3 before but let's remember when I put 2 in I got 4.5 so what if I put 2 in here I just get 4 that's all I get what if I put 4 in there I get 2 though if I check with 4 in here I can see the 4 gives me 2.3 I just just get the 2 part so the quotient returns that part that's not the function now just so just to highlight this this is still a formula but this is a function it's a function of Excel because it does something it takes inputs and produces an output for us it needs to know something and then it can do whatever we want based upon that and if we look at the formula bar here we've got a number if I click here here's a whole number of functions there I've also got a little tool here called insert function and actually it's recognized I'm using the quotient function and it's giving me that with a little bit of information let's go to this cell here I could then again click on insert function now it doesn't know what I want most you recently used functions are there I could see all functions now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this down arrow and I'm just going to hold it and what I'm holding it you can see the number of functions that are built into Excel that are just constantly scrolling by we're only up to the G's and now the H's and there's lots of them you can tell there's loads of them and the really cool thing is once you get competent and confident in using Excel you can introduce your own functions without concern so that's a really nice thing to be able to do but we're not going to do that I don't need to use the insert there I'm going to instead just type equals then I'm going to start with what I'm looking for I'm going to press the M key and you can see that all the functions that begin with M are now visible in this list now the one we're going to use is this one called mod but I could just keep typing and now we can see it's being reduced even further so I'm going to press the D to finish it off and then open brackets every function has the name of the function in this case MOD in the other one quotient followed by an open bracket that's a rule you know every function is its name open brackets then we're looking for the number we're interested in in this case our nine comma separates and that's what this help point is giving us there's a comma you can see number is bold as soon as I press comma the divisor becomes bold that's telling me now that's what you're putting in and there's a little bit of help if I want it but the divisor is that number there and I'm going to close the brackets off and now press enter now what I've got is I've got the result one let's put this back to three and I've got zero nine divided by three is three remainder zero this is old school maths this is primary maths this is when you didn't you were learning about division you didn't understand division so you weren't doing fractions you weren't doing decimals you didn't know those you just come off of counting to ten so what they're doing now is introducing you to the idea of division with the idea of this what's left over so two does not go into nine neatly two goes into nine four times remainder one and if you think about the tiny cubes or whatever you used or matchsticks that you used at school and you would have had nine of them and you'd have taken two out then two out then two out then two out and you will realize you've got four groups of two with one left over and you can't do anything with that one so it just sits there I've got four groups of two with one left over and that's what mod is about 
So if I put four into there, I find that I've got two with one left over. What's really, what I'm really interested in getting here is when I look at three, three goes into nine neatly and it gives me zero. Nine goes into nine really neatly. Now this is where the numbers I've chosen aren't much use. So let's look at a number like 20. I can see that two goes into 20 really neatly with nothing left over. So does four go in with nothing left over? What about five goes in with really neatly with nothing left over? And 10 goes in neatly with nothing left over. And that's really important. When the number goes in neatly, we're left over with nothing. And that's going to be really important in our next revision exercise, which is coming up next. Our revision three on the times table square. See you there. Okay, so last time we were working on the lesson, we looked at the mod function. So all I'm going to do is save what I've worked on and close it down. Hopefully you've been doing that as you've been going along. Now I'm going to go to file and I'm going to look for the times table square and I'm going to open that. So what we're going to do is pull everything together and finalize this time table square. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to move everything around a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take three rows and I'm going to insert three new rows along the top. Don't matter, doesn't matter if it drops off the bottom, that's not a problem. Then I'm going to choose three columns and do the same thing there. So now what I can do is, what I want to do is, is build a new part here. So what I'm going to allow the user to do is enter a number and that's going to cha change the number here. I'm going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to use a box. So just using there and simply say outside or I could have said all and same thing I'm going to do there and whatever's put into this box is going to appear here and same thing whatever I put in here will appear here so let's just start that off I'm going to put a one in there now obviously I want that to be like that centered centered and size 16 just check that's what I've used before I've used size 16. The only difference is I haven't used bold. So I'm going to use that. Now, what I can do is I can use this tool here called the Format Painter. Just click on that and click in that box. And now, if I put a one in that box, that format's automatically copied across. So this Format Painter is really useful, and we will redo, redo that in a later lesson. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this cell and say equals there. Now if you remember I said there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with using a formula to look at the cell and just grab that cell. That's what we've done. And I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to say equals that. So all it means is if I change this the number there will change but so will all those and if I change this that number will change and so so will all those. So that's really nice but let's put that back for the moment. Let's then use that insert symbol and let's use the time symbol in there. Again I want to make sure that that is centered and I know what I'm going to do actually is take that. Now I've got to be careful because it's got a border and I don't want the border so let's not do that. Border border size 16 and bold. I'm going to put another box here. That box can be like this one so use the format painter to click there. Similarly I'm going to copy that so right click copy go to there right click paste and there it is. Then all I'm going to do is put a box and tell it to format paint into that box there. So what's the point of this second box? Well this is the multiplier and it, it might be a bit confusing this symbol so it might be not the best thing to have used but we'll, we'll have a look at that. 
what I'm going to do is this is going to be the stepper for all the following numbers. So if I put a number in there, it's going to simply step these up by the value here. So this value here is going to be equal to the previous value plus the value in there. That means this cell is going to be this one plus the value in there. In fact, if I do that, that's going to be what I'm looking for. Similarly here, this cell is going to be equal to that cell plus whatever's in there. And this cell is going to be nothing more than this one here. It's going to be nothing more than this cell plus there, which is the same formula. So I'm going to pull that one down to there. Now if I put one in there and one in there, I don't get what I wanted. Why not? Well, obviously, when I did this, that moved. So the H changed to I. Of course, we're meant to use our absolute addressing. Now when I pull that across, now it works. Similarly here, that's looking at C8, but when I go to there, it's looking at C9. Oh, of course, I need to use the absolute addressing there, and then pull that down there. Now we're back to exactly where we were before. But now I can change this and it will start at 2. Or I can start it at 10. And then I can do it in multiples of 10. Well, there is a bit of an issue here in that this number becomes too big. So maybe I want to limit that. Maybe I want to make sure that you can't put larger values in there. This one here, I just need it to be a value. But again, if I put 100 in, that ruins everything. 99 ruins everything. So I need to find the ideal value that gets me to where I want to be. 20 still takes us too far. 15 is fine. So I want to limit the numbers here, but again, I've got to recognize that the same thing will happen here. Another way around that, obviously, is to say, no, I'll tell you what, we'll do a 10 by 10, and we'll do a 10 by 10, and then all we've got to actually do is select the whole sheet and just decrease the font until it drops to a size we're happy with. Now that's taking it right down. Let's see, 12 works. 14 expands our cells, we don't want that. So 12 works. Let's just check what our cell widths are. They're 50 there, so they seem quite happy, but they're 51 there. So let's take them back to 50. Same thing here, let's just check. There's no reason for those to have changed, they haven't. So everything's there. So we want these be to be between 10 and 10. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna add a new sheet and I'm gonna call that sheet data. And I'm just going to put the numbers one, two, three, four, but I'm not because all I'm gonna do is take the first two and take that down to 10. Why 10? because we've now agreed that's going to be our limit here. And just to use things we've used before, what I'm going to do is go to the data, data validation, and tell it to be a list. The source of that list is going to be here, and I'm going to choose that source of list there. By the way, you can just click on the column and it will choose the whole column, but then I'll have one million blank spaces. If I do that, it just restricts it to that set of data. So there you go. I've got that there. I might want to put an error message in. Incorrect value. You must ensure the number you enter is between 1 and 10. Okay, so 
now I've got that there and my drop down works quite nicely it knows I've got 10 in there so it works can I put anything else in there no because it won't allow it which is perfect only an item on the list I'll do the same thing here data validation go to settings change that to list same source data that list there go to the error message incorrect value can't remember the message but that's fine please enter a value between 1 and 10 click OK and again I've got a drop down here just for difference we're going to use data validation rule here but instead of using a list we're just going to tell it it's got to be a whole number between 1 and 10 error message well we won't bother we've seen how to use that we'll do there the same thing settings and set out an error a whole number with 1 to 10 and again we won't worry about an error message if I was building this professionally obviously I would be but I'm um, we're doing this to see how the system works now I've got the formatting here and everything else but I want to tidy this up a little bit more so what I'm going to do I'm going to do something that seems a bit more well, dangerous I'm going to do select the whole sheet and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do home and fill everything black now the reason why it's dangerous is because I can't see anything but that's all right I'm going to start at B2 and I'm going to take that down a bit and I'm going to change that to white the advantage of doing the whole sheet black is because now I have got the whole sheet as black now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the one nearest to the right hand side the column nearest to the right hand side of my table and I'm going to reduce that right down so let's take it down to 10 now what I'm then going to do is reduce this one by the same thing let's take it to 10 there and finally the one on this edge I'm going to take to 10 as well and just scroll down to the bottom and when I said finally I was lying because I've got to take this one to 10 as well and that's really nice I've got this really narrow one this one's not so narrow and this one I don't need to be white anymore so let's just fill that with black so it's disappeared I do need a new row so I'm going to insert a new row I don't need a new column at this stage but what I'm going to do is with this Q column the one that's still white I'm going to go just above and I'm going to go just below in fact no I'm just going to go from below to just below that edge there and I'm going to choose a dark gray that one's just a bit darker that one this one here I've left at the top becomes black now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run across the bottom here and just before the really thin end stop and again choose the same gray oops it's going to be on that list there I'm going to select from the top corner right down to the bottom of just the white part and choose thick outside border and then I'm going to grab the Q and I'm going to make that really thin not just 10 but go for 5 if I can this becomes quite tricky but we can do that I'm going to do the same thing here and pull that up to there and get that to 5 as well I can now reduce the added one that I had and make it a lot smaller and I can do the same to this one a little bit smaller just to pull everything into line 
Now I can go back and colour these as I want to where I want them to be. Okay. So now what I've got is I've got my edges and I've got the calculations here without any problems whatsoever. These are probably a bit wide, looks a little bit chunky, so I'm going to halve that down to 30. And this is where it fights you for a short while. And then that one down to 30. Okay. I'm now going to remove the protection on there. Now if you remember I right click and I go to format cells and I remove the lock and do the same thing in that one. Format cells, remove the lock, that cell, format cell, remove the lock, that one, format cell, remove the lock. What I might do with this background is now change it to the light yellow. Change these to something that stands out against that. These could be very garish colours, but we'll see how they go. They go a nice dark green and a nice dark blue. And these become white to make it clear that that's where you can enter data. Now if I go to the second sheet, I can right click and hide the sheet. Now it's slightly harder to get the sheets back, but that's not a huge problem. I can right click and click choose unhide and it will show me all the hidden sheets. But we're not going to do that at this stage. What I am going to do for this moment is go to review and actually not yet. You might be wondering where the mod comes in. Well, and the conditional formatting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select all the values here. And what I'm going to tell the system to do is I'm going to go to Home and Conditional Formatting. I'm going to go to Manage Rules. I'm going to go to New Rule and I'm going to select the bottom one. Use a formula to determine which cells to format. Now all I'm going to do is choose the active cell there initially. Use the active cell. It will apply, Excel will apply to all the other ones. F7. So all I'm going to do is if F7, oh sorry, if mod open brackets F, F7, comma 2 close brackets is equal to 0. If the value in F7 is divided by 0 results in, sorry, divided by 2 returns a remainder of 0, then the number in F7 must be divisible by 2. That means that we are ending up with something that is always divisible by 2, what we call an even number. So if we do that, this will mean that we now know the number is even. So what I'm going to do is tell that to format. And let's tell the format background to be, oh, let's choose that color for no other reason. And we're going to click OK, apply. And obviously all the numbers on there are. But if we, oops, click OK. If we now click here, and tell it to use the one step and we do the same thing here until the one step we can already see we're getting the pattern that we're looking for we don't need any other rule we can see the odd numbers clearly against the even numbers but we want to change the odd numbers so let's now select that again Let's now do the conditional formatting, go to Manage Rules, and we're going to add another new rule. And it's again going to use the formula equals, and it looks like the same formula, mod, open brackets, F7, comma, 2, close brackets. But instead of equals to 0, it's just going to be any number other than 0, simply greater 
than zero because any remainder will be any number bigger than zero. If I do that and choose a different format color, let's go for um, this. We want to be careful of the blue. Let's use this kind of orangey color, gold. Let's call it gold. If I apply that, we can now see that gold doesn't stand out as much as we thought, but it's perfectly adequate. It gives us, and those are really bad colors, but it works for us. It shows us what we're looking for as we vary those numbers. So that mod function has allowed us to identify the even numbers. If I set a two there, then the pattern changes. And if I set a two there, then the pattern changes again, and they're all odd. And if I put a four there, they're all odd what if I put a three there we get that alternation so it's a really nice thing we've got here but obviously every time I type something or select something off this list then I'm going to drop down I can click anywhere and I can distort the sheet so all I'm going to do now is go review protect sheet say no you cannot select lock cells click OK and now I can only use these cells. And if I try to enter anything outside the remit, I get an error message. And we start to get some nice patterns going through. So if we only use even numbers, we can see that. But every time we use some odd numbers, we finally start to get some odd numbers in. And you can play around with those and find what patterns arrive. So the times table square has allowed us to test out everything we've looked at to date, everything we've experimented with to date. That's been a lot thrown at you, but there's been a lot achieved in a short space of time. I do hope that's been really useful. We're going to try a new project and a new set of videos starting next. So here we are. We finished the times table square and we're now going on to a set of new topics. To help us get our heads around that new topic, we're going to need a new revision aid that we're going to use. So we're going to start that off now because quite a lot of how we're going to start that off is using prior knowledge. And I'm not going to apologize for the fact that we're going to go over things again because the one thing with Excel is that you will use the same tools time and time again. And the more we use them, the more familiar you'll become with them. So to get started, we're going to click on the start. We're going to find Excel, start Excel. We're going to choose a blank workbook and I'm going to maximize that. And all I did to maximize it, in case you're not aware of what I did, I can click on the square there that will maximize, but I can equally just click on the top border of Excel and that will maximize as well. Now, the first thing I know I'm going to need is a worksheet that actually is my introduction. Now this introduction we're not going to use at the moment but we will do later on just to finalize everything. So I'm just going to call this introduction. Now, there's no way you'd know that. Obviously I know that because I know where we're going. But you wouldn't know that but that's fine. Just stick with us on there. We're going to need another worksheet so I'm going to click plus. Now we're going to develop a game and that game is going to have two players, a blue player and a green player. We're going to work with just one of those players at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on here and I'm going to put blue setup. And I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to introduce any new sheets at the moment. The most important thing I need to do now is start to set up this sheet here but only very basically so what I'm going to do I'm going to click and select the whole sheet and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to alter the width of the columns to 50 and I'm going to do what we've done several times before and 
make these and alter the height of the rows as well so we get squares remember I can do 50 because it stands out on my screen quite nicely if your resolution is lower then just lower that value to 40 or 30 to get the same effect you want everything to be in one area the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a, a, a range of cells and I want an 11 by 11 grid so I've got that there I'm then going to click on the border tool and I'm going to select all borders so I've got that then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this top corner and as we've done before I'm just going to get rid of the two lines now I could do that by simply choosing left and top but it's probably quicker for me to click on more borders and just click on the two lines I don't want and click OK next one I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this cell here and I'm going to put a capital A in there and then I want to get that formatted so I'm going to make it bold center center vertically and then increase the font size to something that I think works and I think that works actually let's take it up to 20 and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put B and then C and then D E F G H I and J I'm then going to take this I'm going to take the bottom corner pull that across but obviously I'm not going to fill series because I've just put all the letters in but what I can do is right click sorry release the right hand mouse button fill formatting only and then that applies the formatting across the whole lot then what I'm going to do is push one I'm going to take this one here choose the format painter and apply that to that one then right click on the bottom right hand corner pull down and then select fill series and that's what I need to do at this stage for this particular sheet in fact we're going to do a lot more to that sheet but before we do I need to copy this sheet so what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the bottom here and I'm going to choose move or copy I'm going to click on there remember this is the context menu so it's all related to the worksheets and I'm going to move this to the end of the sheet but if I just click OK now it will simply move it and since it's at the end nothing will change I want to create a copy I'm going to click OK now I've got blue dash setup and Excel doesn't know what it should be called so they've just put a 2 there that's fine all I'm going to do is I'm going to double click go to the end of there delete the word all the way up to the word setup take the word setup out and replace that with the word play I had caps lock locked so let's put play properly so I've got my three worksheets that I want okay the blue one blue play we can now leave alone I'm now going to go back to here and what I'm now going to do is I'm going to choose the whole worksheet and I'm going to fill it so bucket fill all black I know this was a 11 by 11 grid so I can choose cell B and just keep going down till it says 11 by 11 in the named range box let go and then choose white I don't want this box to appear so that certainly can be black and these ones because this is the blue player I'm going to color these this light blue same thing with these then they stand out a little bit better the next thing I'm going to want to do is choose a point over here and I'm going to take this all the way down to 8 and then go across to the new AA I'm going to choose that blue again I'm going to do the same thing here and choose that blue again now 
what I'm going to do here is put some words in I'm going to put some abbreviations in so QTY again we're used to putting data in SQ this one's going to be a full term craft type one two three four so just going back one two three four go to the fifth type in code go to the next one type in used now this one is quite useful I'm going to choose these four here and using the border tool choose all borders and I'm going to fill these with this light color here these here I'm going to select so remember click hold the mouse button down drag over I'm going to make them all bold and I'm going to center them horizontally center them vertically don't worry about this craft type being cut off that's not a problem and then the only thing I'm going to do now is change the font size to 14 now what I'm going to do here we're going to have some long words here so first thing I'm going to do here just to fill out the other details four three two one now again I can grab this bottom right hand corner click drag down and just tell it to fill formatting only this is the reverse of that one two three four so again pull that down fill formatting only here I'm just going to put S capital S capital D capital B capital A and again grab pull down formatting only and here I'm going to put the words and this is going to give you a clue of what we're working on sub destroyer battleship aircraft carrier again drag that downwards fill format now I could have typed all that in and just simply selected these group and just fill formatted the whole lot in one go well now we've got a destroyer a tooling ship and an aft carrier but that's fine because of what we're going to do next what we're going to do now is if you remember I left four squares I'm going to select the four squares for sub choose merge and center and then just simply tell it to be aligned right we're going to do that for destroyer select all four merge and center align right again for battleship select the four merge align right click and choose the four it doesn't matter which direction you go in by the way if I went that direction merge align right and then same thing here merge align right so we've almost got to where we want to be the only other thing I want to do is here I'm going to take all of these and I'm going to merge and center and then I'm going to type in the word messages obviously I want this to be centered which it already is but also vertically centered I want this to be bold and I'm going to increase the font size until it's nice and large that's let's go to 20 I'm going to do the same thing here select them all merge and center but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill them with this cream color I'm going to do exactly the same thing select them all merge them fill them with the cream color now select this top one and just simply tell it to have the bottom border okay so now what we've got is everything in place that we want when we want to move forward and clearly we're going to be creating the game battleships if you're not familiar with this this is where you will decide you'll put some codes down here the S D B and A you'll hide your naval vehicles here and then your opponent will do the same and you'll take shots at each other and see if you can sink the entire naval fleet of the opposing player we've got everything we want 
all we've got to do now is save this so let's go to file save or save as remember it doesn't matter I'm going to go to save as I'm going to save it to Excel lessons which is where I've been saving everything and I'm going to call this battleships and just click save or press enter it doesn't matter they lead to the same thing it's called battleships again mine's gone to auto save so I'm going to switch that off just in case you haven't got that in place and that's everything I need for this point in time in the next lesson we're going to start looking at some of the other functions the ones that we're going to then use in this system Congratulations on completing this free 4-hour Microsoft Excel basics course. It's a pretty great achievement and I hope that you have enjoyed it. You are now ready to get started on using it on your own. If you would like to uncover all the hidden tips and tricks of working with Excel, head over to skillademia.com. The beginner to advanced course consists of many more hours of explanations, exercises and demos which will turn you into a pro in no time. You'll be able to learn more about the advanced functions of Excel, as well as dive deeper into important areas such as data visualization, data analysis, and programming in Excel using VBA macros. All of that while applying your knowledge on different projects and practicing your skills together with the instructors. If this sounds like the course for you, go check it out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.